All right. Greetings, everyone. Greetings, greetings, friends. Good to have you here in the chamber, whether you're back here behind the rail with me out there in City Hall uh, or listening online. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, it is Tuesday, February 6th, 2024. And we are gathered here with the athens Clark County Commission and myself, Mayor Kelly Gertz, for our monthly voting meeting. Uh, if business has not concluded by 8.15, we'll take a 15-minute break at that time. Uh, but as we begin, I'd like to ask Clerk Spratlin, who's here with me, uh, to call roll for us. Davenport, Mayor. Here. Here. Tyler. Here. Right. Present. Fisher. Here. Poole. Here. Culpepper. Here. Myers. Here. Thornton. Here. Hamby. We have a call. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right. Uh, just a couple quick items of business. Uh, we need uh, a motion to approve the minutes of meetings of Tuesday, January 2nd, Tuesday, January 9th, Tuesday, January 16th, Friday, January 26th, and non-voting meetings of Tuesday, January 9th, Tuesday, January 16th, and Friday, January 26th. Do I hear a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. All right. I've got a motion from Commissioner Wright. And the second is from Commissioner Taylor. All, right. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any written communications tonight? No, we have none tonight. Uh, all right, uh, just a kind of uh, agenda setting uh, motion. Uh, several items were not ready for consummation, and so I'm uh, recommending that we remove items one, two, three, four, five, and six from the agenda for further work. Could I get a motion to amend the agenda to that effect? I would like, or so moved, but I would like to make a motion to keep the Eastside Downtown Tad Development Plan um, on for discussion. I will be creating a CDO um, to discuss a different percentage of what's being recommended. So, Commissioner Taylor, have you engaged Oh, I'm engaged. <laughs> have, 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 have you placed that on the agenda for Clerk Spratlin? No, not yet. So what I'd recommend is that we hold that for a date certain. That could be the next voting meeting, kind of one month from tonight. That, okay. that would be so my fault. I wasn't sure it was necessary to do a CDO, and all we're talking about is a 30% change in the number. So Yeah, changing the number. I mean, I thought we've done CDOs on the floor before, you know. Uh, she did call me about it and asked me, should she need to do a CDO? And I was like, well, it's just changing a percentage. You know, I'm not sure it's necessary. You can make that on the floor. Uh, my bad if I messed up there. Well, let's let's discuss <coughs> this. All right. But my recommendation will be that given uh, sort of the complexity of the tool, that that's something that we would want to have a vote on in a subsequent meeting. But glad for discussion tonight. So we will be removing items one two four five and six from the agenda and leaving three on for discussion i have a motion to that uh, quick, quick question um so if you're going to um leave that off for a discussion on tad um commissioner commissioner taylor's request are you saying are you giving us a date or is it what well, would i when we get to the substance of the question, my recommendation will be that we vote at a subsequent meeting a month from now. Uh, uh, what, uh, that we vote at a subsequent meeting, not tonight, but a month from now. A month from now. Correct. March. So we're talking about March. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. A motion to amend the agenda to that effect. So, so move. I thought you should. But first was the motion. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I need a second. So I've got a motion second. from Commissioner Taylor, second from Commissioner Link. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? All right, uh, we've got a couple of exciting things as we sometimes do. So I'm going to come down next to Clerk Spratlin. Mm -hmm. Did you Spratlin? I got it. I think so. There we go. All right. Um, We've got uh, one resident recognition and then some staff recognition. So I'm really excited about all of these, uh, but I think uh, above all else, really excited about the very first one of these. Uh, so I'd like to ask a, a longtime resident of athens Clark County, Harold Rittenberry, to come join me up here if he would. Mr. Rittenberry.
So uh, I, I've um, known Mr. Rittenberry for quite some time, knocked on his door a time or two, um, and, and certainly enjoyed the art that he's brought to this community we love so much and to the planet uh, to stand in front of us. Uh, Mr. Rittenberry is best known in and around Athens for his majestic and whimsical meta metal sculptures. Um, they're iconic, and several of them are hosted in our public parks, uh, like in Dudley Park and at the Linden House, just a couple blocks from here. Um, this longtime Athenian has been drawing, cutting, and welding metal for his lifetime. Uh, he's a self taught artist uh, and a beloved Athens icon. Uh, in December, he was recognized. Uh, by Governor Brian Kemp with a Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities. Uh, this award recognizes and honors individuals and organizations who've made outstanding contributions to the cultural vitality of the state. And so we are lucky tonight to bring you the Governor's Award for Arts and Humanities, Mr. Rittenberry. We Thank want you to have that. Not done with you, Mr. Rittenberry. So, you so much. Um, a, a, as a metallurgist, as a sculptor, we want you to have uh, as much raw material to work with as you possibly can have. <laughs> and given that uh, one of the opportunities that I have in my role <coughs> is to provide what in this case is a very deserved key to the city, uh, I'd like you. to present Mr. Harold Rittenberry with a key to the city. I can only hope this shows up in one of the sculptures. Let's take a picture. Thank you for having me. All right, thank you, Mr. Rittenberry. Everybody give him a round of applause. All right, we have a couple of staff awards that we sometimes do. Uh, so at this point, uh, I'd like to take a moment to recognize our award-winning Leisure Services Department, who, who over many years have engaged with Mr. Rittenberry, among other things. Uh, back in December, we started our meeting by celebrating the department as they were honored with three Georgia Recreation and Park Association Awards. And now, just a few short months later, uh, we assemble again to recognize department staff with six more awards. Mm. And so I'd ask uh, Leisure Services Director Kent Kilpatrick to come join me. Evening, Kent. Good to see you. It's been so long. How are you? Thanks for coming up. Thank you. So tonight, uh, we're going to honor Nina Gilrath, the East Athens Educational Dance Center's program supervisor. Uh, so if Nina could come join us. It's great to see you. Thank you for... Uh, Nina was recently honored with the Dance USA Champion Award. Dance USA is the national service organization for dance, serving a broad cross-section of the dance field. Established in 1982, Dance USA champions an inclusive and equitable dance field by leading, convening, advocating, and supporting individuals and organizations. Um, so we have an award for you. It's heavy. Yeah. Congratulations. So uh, j just to note that in December, she was recognized by Georgia Governor Brian Kemp with the Governor's Award for the Arts and Humanities. Uh, these awards recognize and honor individuals and organizations who've made outstanding contributions to the civic or, or cultural vitality of the state, and Nina certainly presents that face for us here in Athens. Uh, so thank you, thank Nina. You. We appreciate it very much. All right, but we are not done. We are not done. I'd like to ask my friend Lynn Green, Morton Theater Facility Supervisor, to join us now. Thanks for coming here. Uh, so in January, the 34th annual Emancipation Proclamation Pioneer Awards were presented. The theme was a salute to the arts. 
Among the honorees were Morton Theater Facility Supervisor Lynn Green for, in their words, unselfish and dedicated service to the arts. For over two decades, Lynn has served the Morton Theater, including as a member of the theater staff for 17 years, and her previous roles as a contractor, board member, and interim arts division administrator we recognize as well. The Morton Theater was also a 2024 Pioneer Award honoree. Uh, as we know, built in 1910 by Monroe Bowers Morton, it's one of the first and the oldest surviving African-American vaudeville theaters in the United States. The theater was a primary entertainment facility for the city's black community for many years, and it's the only theater from the earliest 20th century that survives uh, in here in athens Clark County. So we're going to present this plaque. Congratulations, Lynn. All right, and then um, uh, we have uh, uh, another award, and, and I guess we have two for the Morton, one for Lynn and one for the Morton Theater. Okay, yes, uh, and so you, you get a, a double dose double of dose. plaques. <laughs> All right, she's not going to walk out of here empty-handed. All right, thank you. All right. All right, and now if uh, Dee Dee Dunphy, who I knew I saw tonight, uh, who's the Linden House Arts Center Facility Supervisor, could join us now. Good to see you, Dee Dee. Thank you. All right, uh, last month, the Georgia Association of Museums held their annual conference here in Athens. The Linden House Arts Center received two awards at the gathering. The first was a special project category two award for resilient civics and musical life. Uh, for the Ware, Linden House, Enslaved and Descendant Stories program. Uh, this award recognizes a museum exhibition that demonstrates scholarship and originality contributing to the cultural fabric of the state. The exhibition is an example of excellence in theory, planning, and implementation, and has effectively reached and broadened the museum or gallery audience. All right, so that's the first one. And like Lynn, we're not done. Uh, the second award is the 2024 Institution Award, which recognizes institutional members such as nonprofit museums, historic sites, and galleries for leadership at the local and statewide level. Uh, by winning this award, the Linden House Arts Center is identified as the leading institution in Georgia with a past record of accomplishment and acts as an important cultural resource in its community. So we'd like to present you with this as well. Thank you. All right. Everybody round of applause. All right. Everybody give it up for our fabulous arts community. All right, so um, we are going to begin uh, with uh, the first of several opportunities for public input, and that will be opportunity for public input on what we term our consent agenda. Uh, these are items that receive a single vote, and uh, we, we want to continue to hear from you. Uh, first thing I need to do is ask, is there any commissioner who would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? All right. So members of the public, um, rules of public input are that you'll have three minutes for your input. That'll be consistent throughout the night with one small exception that I'll discuss when we get to planning and zoning items. Uh, in those three minutes, you may begin speaking as soon as you approach the mic. You're going to see a light in front of Clerk Spratlin. It's going to turn green when you begin speaking. It's going to turn yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining. And surprise, surprise, it's going to turn red when you're three minutes has concluded and I'm going to thank you for your time uh, because we got a lot of other folks we're going to have to move on to the next person uh, when folks are involved in public input please listen quietly uh, we're not here for any demonstrations uh, anything negative or positive because we want to hear the folks who have come to join us for public input um, if you would if you're planning on making public input if you make sure you either got a card out in the hall or grab one there and just kind of leave them behind uh, attorney Drake um, on the podium, we need to be able to accurately capture your name and your place of residence 
for the public record. So we just ask you to fill out a card as well. Uh, so again, uh, the consent agenda are items 7 through 23, 7 through 23. Would any commissioner, or excuse me, any member of the public like to speak to any of those items 7 through 23? All right, step right up. Let us know your name and where you live. Um, hi, I'm Dylan Woolsey from 395 River Road. I'm here to speak in support of items 7, 9, and 20. Um, for item 7, um, this is a very good opportunity to help uh, address some of our especially racial inequities in terms of uh, housing. Um, it's in terms of there's larger poverty, larger um, cost of living associated um, with our minority communities. And this uh, grant, if accepted and being able to be funded, would be, go to uh, a great deal of way in addressing these inequities and improving the standard of living for many Athenians. Um, for item 9, the, um, address, the HUD grant addressing lead. Um, this is a great way to decrease potential uh, lead, um, which is a public health hazard. Um, this would definitely increase the quality of life for many Athenians, especially those also likely more minority and impoverished communities. And this is just, for both of these items, these are both very great, even if you want to think economical terms, returns of an investment in terms of creating a more uh, healthy po um, population here in Athens is a more productive population. And then finally, for item 20, um, the, I think it's the raise um, for the corridor. Um, this is a great way to decrease uh, potential fatalities um, along this corridor. This is a, um, this funding will go a great wa um, way towards um, reducing potential crashes, potential traffic as well. Um, this corridor has been heavily frequented and as I saw in some of the attachments has many fatalities and many crashes associated with it. So I think the um, studying of this and trying to introduce alternatives um, such as biking or more for public trans transportation along this corridor would do a great deal to help reduce any potential problems including fatalities and crashes. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. I appreciate it. Is there anyone else here to speak to any item on the consent agenda? Again, those are items 7 through 23. 7 through 23. All right. Hearing none, I'd uh, entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda. Yeah, I'll get a motion in a second, then I'll have Attorney Drake read the ordinances. Is there a motion? All right, got a motion from Commissioner Fisher. Who's the second? Davenport. All right, Davenport was the second. All right, and Attorney Drake has several ordinances to read that are part of the consent agenda. Yes. <coughs> Number 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 have ordinances associated with them. Number seven, an ordinance to amend the FY 2024 annual operating and capital budget for athens Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide grant funding if awarded to the Housing and Community Development HCD Department from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, the FY 223 Fair Housing Education and Outreach Initiative Grant Program in order to provide funding for identifying and overcoming local barriers to affordable housing, production, and preservation, and for other purposes. <coughs> Number eight, an ordinance to amend the FY 2024 annual operating and capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide funding for bio, solids, hauling and disposal, and for other purposes. Number nine, an ordinance to amend the FY 2024 annual operating and capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide grant funding if awarded to the Housing and Community Development HCD Department from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD FY 22, Lead has a reduction capacity building grant program in order to provide funding for identifying and overcoming local barriers to affordable housing production and preservation <coughs> and for other purposes. Number 10, in order to amend the FY 2024 operating and capital budget for athens Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide grant funding from the Federal Aviation Administration and the Georgia Department of Transportation for Taxiway A reconstruction and realignment project phase two and for other purposes. And ordinance number 11, an ordinance Item, agenda item number 11, ordinance with respect to establishing residential parking permits for O'Farrell Street between its intersection with Southview Drive and its intersection with Hampton Court and for other purposes. All right. Uh, thank you, Attorney Drake. All right. We have a motion on the floor from uh, Commissioner Fisher. We've got a second from Commissioner Davenport. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, motion carries. All right. Uh, we are moving on uh, to our planning and zoning items. Uh, of which we have uh, four this evening. Um, first item is just a text amendment regarding special appeal procedures 
for type five planning action. So this is a uh, part of our administrative appeal process. Um, planning and zoning public input is slightly different. Somebody can sign for a 10 minute slot in advance. We have nobody who signed up for a 10 minute slot in advance for this item, but is there anyone else who would like to speak to item 24? 24, administrative procedures, exciting stuff. <laughs> All right, hearing none, I'd entertain a motion from the body. So move. Second. second. All right, got a motion from Commissioner Wright and second from Commissioner Davenport. Uh, Commissioner Wright, any input on the side? No comment, ready to vote. Uh, Commissioner Davenport? Yep, this is just streamlines the process. Commissioner Link? Yeah, um, I wasn't here at the agenda setting meeting, so I just want to have a couple questions. Um, so does this move some of these appeals from the hearings board to an appointed officer? Is that what we're talking about? Is that all appeals? It would be anything that falls into one of two categories. The, the categories being a staff issued permit, a counter permit, if there's an appeal of that decision. It would go to the hearings officer instead of the hearings board. Uh -huh. And the other would be any kind of interpretation by the planning director of a code issue if if a person is affected by that they could appeal that decision by the planning director to the hearings officer so does this would this be like demolition permits they're not part of this no it okay. would not be that okay um okay that clarifies it a little bit thank you all right i'll have attorney drake read the ordinance in ordinance to amend the code of athens clark county georgia with respect to appeal procedures for type four planning actions and for other purposes <clears throat> Thanks, Attorney Drake. Any other input from members of the body? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, hearing none, motion carries. All right, uh, item 25 is a text amendment regarding creation of a new land use for short-term <laughs> vacation rentals. Uh, we do have a uh, gentleman who signed up for the 10-minute segment, uh, Mr. Ellison. So we'll begin with Mr. Ellison. We'll go to everybody else after that. Good evening. Just, uh, again, read your name into the record, and you have 10 minutes, sir. Uh, good evening, David Ellison. I'm here on behalf of several clients, uh, including an organization of local citizens who own short-term rentals. Uh, we're here today to speak in opposition to this proposed ordinance for a variety of reasons. Uh, first, we believe there are a number of legal flaws in this proposed ordinance. One, we believe that this may be a violation of the zoning procedures law. On a recent uh, revision to the ZPL, uh, certain uh, revisions to the zoning code required enhanced notice and hearing requirements. This includes instances where you're granting blanket permissions under certain circumstances for property owners to deviate from zoning requirements for single family residential zones. In this instance, we believe that this blanket permission for short term home occupations would trigger the enhanced notice and hearing requirements. Uh, this uh, new law came into effect, I believe, last year, so no cases have interpreted it, but we believe this would be subject to this additional requirement. Even if not a technical violation of the ZPL, we don't believe this complies with the spirit of the ZPL, which is intended to provide citizens a meaningful opportunity to be heard. According to the staff report that's before you tonight, this process started in July of 2022. And this 24-month termination period was introduced as a condition from the Planning Commission last month. Many property owners and citizens are now finding out about this for the first time. So we ask that you not take action tonight because if you violate the ZPL, the ordinance is invalid. There's a couple other substantive issues with this ordinance as well. Chief among them is the 24-month termination period. In a case nearly on point, the Georgia Supreme Court has held that a local government may not enact an ordinance that eliminates nonconformities within a stated period of time without providing compensation to the aggrieved owners. That's exactly what's happening here. You know, some states, however, Georgia's not among them, some states allow an involuntary termination of a nonconformity over a period of time, but they use an uh, amortization schedule to give the nonconforming owner an opportunity to realize his investment. So states that take this approach look towards ordinary business and tax accounting practices to capture that depreciation schedule. In this instance, the IRS has a 27 and a half year depreciation schedule. <coughs> so we believe if the county is going to try to use this involuntary termination of a period of time, 
you need to be looking closer to 27 and a half years, which the IRS uses, or some other business practice instead of two years. Because at the end of the day, an ability to lease property is a fundamental right, and any interference with that right is considered a taking. So even if you take this approach, it's still subject to a challenge. The other issues we have is that we believe this violates due process. The fundamental aspect of due process is a balancing act between the property owner and the government. The government has the right to advance legitimate public interests such as safety, welfare, and health of the community. But in this instance, there is no balancing because y'all are proposing an outright prohibition across the county. There's no balancing here. Yeah, I'm looking at y'all's proposed ordinance section one, subsection D, <coughs> and there's certain you know, quality of life issues that y'all believe result from short-term rentals such as too many occupants, noise, increased vehicles parking in the street, trash. I mean, all of these can be remediated through enforcement mechanisms under your existing code or slight revisions to address these issues. As, from my understanding, there's anywhere from 900 to 1,000 short-term rentals in athens Clark County, and it would not be proper for being outright prohibition on all of them when there are less burdensome means to eliminate the bad actors. We also believe that uh, there's a violation of the Commerce Clause. You know, this is a very unique situation to have the Commerce Clause come to a land use scenario, but here we have that exactly here. The government may not force people to become residents to compete on equal playing fields. And this applies for out-of-state actors and out-of-county actors. And so by exclusively allowing owner-occupied short-term rentals, you are discriminating against out-of-state and out-of-county actors. And you can't do that. That's subject to strict scrutiny. And there's no justification for that here in this, under these circumstances. And the other issue, too, is that if you allow this discrimination between owner-occupiers and uh, others, there's also an equal protection issue. The concern is that if you have, I mean, what if, if these short-term rentals are so bad for the community, how can you have a rational relationship to allow some to continue versus others? And when you're discriminating on use of property solely based on the status of the property owner, that should ring alarm bells for anyone who'd be bringing possible equal protection or due process claim. There are there's some other issues too. Uh, for example, uh, there's a state law that prohibits um, any registration of residential rental property, and that's exactly what would be happening here. Um, but beyond these legal issues, think about the policy. I mean, tourism, you look at your comprehensive plan. Tourism, one of the leading industries of athens Clark County. You know, visitors are bringing in money. They're paying sales tax dollars. They're paying hotel motel taxes. You know, from my understanding, the hotel motel tax goes to pay towards the county and a classic authority. Have y'all analyzed the impact of losing this revenue stream over two years? Have y'all analyzed the impact on the classic authority on all the expenditures they're going through if this income stream terminates after two years? So, I mean, think about that from a policy perspective. I understand there's some concern that uh, there's a belief that short-term rentals artificially increase property values. And it's my understanding there's about 55,000 dwelling units in athens Clark County, but only 900 to 1,000 short-term rentals. What is the evidence that this is actually increasing property values to prevent affordable housing? And also, will eliminating short-term rentals suddenly make five points more affordable? Five points is an affordability problem for years. There's no rational basis to say that short-term rentals are the sole problem here. I have a number, some of my clients have had some personal experiences of being short-term rental owners that have asked me to share. Uh, for example, one client has a number of children and grandchildren in Athens, and they visit here for months at a year. And when they're not using the property, they use it as a short-term rental to pay their mortgage and other expenses. You know, I have another property owner uh, who believes that uh, this gives visitors an opportunity to stay here for longer than two or three nights for a typical hotel stay and opens the window for more visitors to come here. And if they visit here, they may stay here. You know, I think about uh, many people who be coming to Athens could be a family. You know, let's say someone has kids, grandkids, who want to stay somewhere to visit another family member in Athens. They can't typically stay at a hotel room. I mean, staying at a hotel room with grandparents and toddlers isn't very fun. And so if they come to Athens to stay with their families, short-term rentals provide a means to stay in that same neighborhood. <clears throat> and what if they like it? What if they want to stay here? 
you know, these people are contributing to the economy here and paying these sales taxes here. By providing uh, these opportunities, it allows people to enjoy Athens and get an idea of the of our community. It allows us citizens to a guest to enjoy local businesses and restaurants. Um, you know, it allows people to get to know their, you know, get to meet more people, and really get to experience the full extent of a college town because we're coming for graduation events, football games, other times. Um, one of my property owners has had a VRBO listed for 14 years. They've had one noise complaint, one noise complaint. You know, they've had guests for celebrations, for graduations of weddings, and have always getting, gotten permission first because they were concerned about parking and concerns for their neighbors. At the end of the day, my clients are concerned that they're being singled out. You know, they're not the bad actors here. But uh, you know, what this is doing is that it's eliminating all possible uses within a certain period of time. And there's less restrictive ways to do that. I mean, my clients are willing to pay a license and do other means to ensure that they're not violating any quality of life issues. You know, if there's a, you know, if there's multiple complaints, you know, you can have those rights temporarily suspended. You know, the government can grant a property interest and then take it away following due process of law. So there are options here. <clears throat> and so they're frustrated that they've been playing by the rules and had you know, had real distinct uh, expectations in their investment, and now it's being taken away at a moment's notice within two years. You know, we think that y'all should deny this, or at a very minimum, start this process from a different standpoint so you're not considering, it, you're not possibly voting on it tonight. You know, there needs to be greater input and greater options could be what is least restricted than what is currently proposed. Because if y'all do pass this, then, you, know, you can't send this back to committee to figure out how it's going to work. If y'all pass this tonight, you put property owners on the <laughs> clock to take legal action. And the citizens, my clients who are here, asked me to be here tonight, don't want to go against the city. They will, but they don't want to. They don't want the county's resources being used defending this. You know, they don't want the county's resources uh, being used to enforce an ordinance that is, one, probably unlawful, and two, impractical. So we're asking that you please refrain from uh, adopting this ordinance tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. If anyone else would like to speak to uh, uh, item 25, uh, just uh, come on up to the podium again. Give us your name and your place of residence. And if, you, uh, if, if there are other folks, if you'd line up, that way we can make sure that we move quickly through the evening. Good evening. My name is Mark Ginsberg. I've owned a property on Poplar Street since 2011. Um, I wanted to address the uh, Planning Commission's addition of the two-year sunset clause to the proposal being voted on tonight. I teach high school, have for 18 years, and during the pandemic, me and my wife explored moving to the east side and renting out our old house near downtown and campus. She cannot work and draws a disability, so I have to find creative ways to supplement our income. In 2021, I bought a house in Snapfinger and converted our old property into an Airbnb, and this decision has greatly reduced stress in both of our lives. Long before that, I spoke to several neighbors. They understood my decision and believed that we can coexist without major issues. That relationship is still intact. In two and a half years, there have been two parties at my STR, one that I stopped because I live here, and another where I was out of town. We continue to discuss how I can prevent problems, and I welcome texts or phone calls about concerns immediately so that I can be proactive. I live here, and I'm invested beyond just money, so can we please create a policy that acknowledges that much? If I were to rent out my STR long term, it would end up with college tenants, the same ones whose loud parties influenced my decision to relocate. While it may be zoned single family, the Poplar Street area's character shifted long ago. I once rented a duplex on the same street, so I'm curious how one land use is grandfathered, but here we are trying to reverse vested land rights that I've held since 2011. I agree that regulation is actually necessary. There are absentee investors. There are a few bad faith party properties. Most importantly, we have a housing crisis. I work with adolescents who are directly affected by it. However, somebody like me, who is invested in the Athens community and with a specific circumstance, who has operated a singular short-term rental business ethically and responsibly and has paid careful attention to the Commission's efforts to build effective regulation, someone like me is just lost in the shuffle. Again, I agree that these situations are problems, but they're vastly different from mine. The original proposal before the two-year sunset clause was added was reasonable. It provided options for me to continue to operate, it prevented new ones from coming in, and it phased them out over time. Then the two-year sunset clause came out of nowhere. My understanding is that the elected commission never seriously discussed the sunset clause until the planning commission added it at the 11th hour. Furthermore, county attorneys have advised against passing anything, including the sunset clause, as lawsuits will follow, as we just heard. 
One article in a local online publication effectively paraphrased the most vocal planning commissioner as saying, adding this provision, the sunset clause was worth the risk because even if it's struck down in court, other regulations should remain intact and will be no worse off. No consideration of my case, just collateral damage is what I am, swept up by planning commissioner's legal experimentation, despite owning that property for nearly 13 years, operating responsibly and ethically, and most certainly doing some amount of small good in this community while paying taxes and fees. Please vote down tonight's proposal and allow the planning commission to immediately revisit this item and craft something more thoughtful. Why allow this legal experimentation? We can follow Atlanta's lead and allow residents to own one of these STRs as long as they reside here in Athens. I don't see the harm in that. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good evening. Evening. Sorry. i got to pull up my note. Uh, my name is Peter Cates. Uh, me and my wife live on King Avenue. Uh, I'm a young professional in Athens and have recently become a father. My wife and I decided to establish roots in Athens a few years ago. Uh, here to speak to item 25. Uh, particularly the piece which restricts primary residents from running out their own homes. As you well know, and what is mentioned in the amendment, is that houses are in less stock and less affordable than they have been in the past. This, while accurate, is a national pattern and not a local issue. It's illogical to claim that Athens, Georgia is an anomaly propped up on the fact that short-term rentals are driving up prices and not the macroeconomics of the housing in the United States or in the Southeast in particular. Have we paused to consider that rent and home prices in Athens will probably never stop increasing because the county continues to allow venture capitalists and equity firms to construct and build, build to rent high rises that continue to drive up rent rates without any reinvestment into our community. My wife and I have been renting out our home for game days and graduation for years. And due to this, I've had the capability to cover costs for our home that we would not otherwise have. Things like replacing our water main or fixing mold, mold issues because of water intrusion in our basement, or repairing our roof from aging issues. The list goes on. What this amendment is telling me is that in order for me and my growing family to be able to afford to live in Athens, is I need to find another source of income, despite already working a full-time job from both of us. Perhaps I'll be able to get a good paying job at night from the hotels that will directly benefit from this being passed. Or is the alternative to invite strangers into my home to share it with me and my children in order to make ends meet, which I don't prefer to take the risk of doing. My motivation for being here tonight is to implore you to reconsider your language in this amendment, particularly pertaining to primary residence restrictions for short terminals. Please ask yourself, is it enriching, apologies, is it enriching our community to restrict people from having a vehicle to be able to afford a home in Athens? Do you think that giving the hotels the capability to charge even more for nightly rates, that they're gonna use their profits to hire local contractors to replace their roof? or fix their plumbing issues, or to spend money on higher than average priced local produce and goods at the Athens Farmer's Market. I wish to send my daughter to private education institutions in Athens like Chase Street Elementary, Clark Middle, and Clark High, but this amendment, if it's passed, reduces my capabilities for affording a property in Athens and greatly diminishes my motivations, or sorry, increases my motivations to move to greater Athens areas like Jackson, Oconee, and Madison County, which if you know me, none of you do, but if you did, you know that I actively speak against this with my peers. Has the council considered passing an amendment? Sorry. <coughs> Has the council considered that passing an amendment like this will actively discourage future residents from owning homes in Athens? I encourage all of you to pause for making this decision tonight and engage with your district citizens and to consider alternatives to reach a similar goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cates. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, County Commissioners, my name is Brandon Smith. My wife, Christy, and I live at 196 Forts and Circle here in Athens. I'm a resident of Clark County, a host of a successful short-term rental in Athens, and I'm very concerned about the elimination of the grandfathering proposal ACC initially considered when attempting to craft language for the new regulations of the short-term rentals here in Clark County. You guys are set to vote tonight on a two-year sunset proposal in lieu of the grandfathering. Uh, commissioner Hamby, my commissioner, claims this proposal will no, not go after the good ones, but only go after the out-of-towners and the bad apples. This was a quote from the flagpole. This is untrue, and I've emailed each of you as much um, explaining that my wife and I have operated a successful short-term rental at our former home. We now live within a mile of it. We have operated it without incident for four years. We are currently operating with the athens Clark County Occupational Tax Permit. 
We are per very particular about who we host. We absolutely do not tolerate any type of party or nuisance behavior from any of our guests. Our neighbors, whom we know, have never complained. We have poured tens of thousands of dollars into this property to create the best possible experience for visitors to Athens. My wife and I have based our retirement plan <coughs> on this property with this use. In the long term, having our property rights infringed upon will be devastating to us. Not to mention this proposal will likely not withstand court challenges according to our own county attorney. I am not against regulating short-term rentals to ensure existing short-term rental property owners comply with the new rules and eliminate the bad actors that have caused disturbances and quality of life issues for my fellow residents. I, with this new proposed regulation that will be put in place, the bad apples can be dealt with by revoking their permits or suspending their permits for violation and non-compliance without violating or depriving the existing good ones, local county taxpayers, of their existing property rights. I would ask this commission to vote down the current version of this proposal, extend the moratorium, gather the necessary data, and revise the proposal to allow existing short-term property owners in good standing to be grandfathered in to avoid future lawsuits that are sure, I assure you, will follow if this current version passes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good evening. Hello, I'm Stephen Davis. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's, um, I've dropped my uh, comments, so I'm going to find them and let somebody else speak. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> As an owner of a short-term rental property, I respectfully ask that the Commission remove the two-year sunset provision for the text <coughs> amendments prior to taking a vote or to vote down the current text amendments so that the two-year sunset provision may be removed or at least properly contested. Short-term rentals as a class are being equated with abuse. Typical short-term rental guests are actually families and friends who are splurging to come to Athens for a special occasion. They want quiet, clean, private, a quiet, clean private place to stay with separate bedrooms, bathrooms, a kitchen, a common area, and possibly a fenced yard for pets. These are amenities that are not possible in a hotel or a condo. They rarely interact with neighbors at all because they're in town spending money with local businesses. These responsibly operated properties are not a topic of conversation because they are not problematic, although they are estimated to be in the hundreds. They're well kept because they're in competition with other rental properties and they depend upon good reviews. Similarly, owners of STR properties are being equated with absentee investors and corporations. I think you would find that most STR properties are second homes owned by families. They have strict house rules and are well maintained because they are a valuable asset to the owners who want no trouble with the community. Real estate investment is one of the most common ways for families to grow their wealth and their purchase of a house in Athens is an investment in Athens itself. Now, after the fact, forcing hundreds of these owners all at once to sell their properties or to become long-term landlords is not a trivial hardship for them. This rapid conversion will also be a shock to the housing market, lowering property values, rents, and hurting the county tax base. It will only have an incremental effect on the problem of party houses and will do nothing to stop absentee investors acquiring more houses for use as long-term rentals. Almost daily, I read complaints from residents about gunshots, fireworks, quote, lots of cop cars, unquote, and, quote, suspicious characters. Those are not short-term rental guests. They are long-term rental tenants and students being students. There is no reason to believe that a conversion from short-term rental to long-term rental will rid residential neighborhoods of abusive behavior. Rather than outlawing STRs, Targeted city ordinances and enforcement would be more effective in combating abuses and less disruptive and destabilizing for all stakeholders. Given its broad repercussions and its limited effectiveness, I ask the commissioners to remove the sunset provision before approving the text amendments. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Good evening. Good evening. Joan Roden, 340 Heather Cove. I'm coming tonight to speak to the STR, but I'll speak to it from a different angle. First of all, this is a very nuanced question, to say the least. But I do want to say that in case I'm not, uh, in case people don't know, 
No homeowner owns their home. If it's paid off, they don't own their home. Because if they don't pay property taxes, they will lose their home. So that's one aspect of this. The second aspect is this. It pays to listen to your constituents. Because I know personally that someone came at least two years ago to explain that there was a problem with a residence that had a VRBO next door and the terrible things that they were experiencing. Two years ago, if you had listened to uh, one, uh, one resident, one homeowner, you would say, if one is having a problem, is it possible that they would have two or maybe three or more? But from this body, we've gotten the, um, the um, information that you don't listen to just one person's whining, that you see a lot of whining and complaining from this body here all the time. So this could have been mitigated a long time ago and could have been being dealt with without all of this, and you would have your two-year period of time. The people that are talking tonight are saying to you, why hasn't this been dealt with before? Just like things that have been brought before in 2018, 2014, 2008, are still being dealt with now and not being taken care of. So I come tonight to say that what is taking place tonight is not equitable and it is not inclusionary because you've got two sides of an issue that could have been mitigated early on if you had recognized maybe this is a problem that we could deal with without all the, uh, without all the confusion and without all the uh, questions and so forth. maybe we could deal with this when we first heard about it. Just like some of the things that I sat in a meeting with HCD and heard about um, of an influx of immigrants that coming into Athens and that Athens was not prepared to handle it. Has that been addressed at all? Or is that just one person that's saying something of that nature? Or the fact that this body has voted on um, security, special security for City Hall that is not afforded to the people of Athens. I say if you listen, you might be able to mitigate things in advance without all these people standing in line. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Red. Good evening. Hi. Uh, Sam Stadler. I live at 228 Cleveland Avenue. I thought I'd be the only person speaking for a more pro-Airbnb position. That's not the case. When I was spoke here in front of you all several months ago, that was the case. I'm sort of grateful. Uh, I wanted to introduce myself as the face, a face of Airbnb that isn't a out-of-town LLC. Uh, I'm a painter. I teach in the art school at UGA. I'm a home builder. Um, I I'm not the boogeyman. I'm someone who pays their mortgage because I have an Airbnb. I'm someone who is able to reduce rent in my uh, the primary home on the property because I make my mortgage payments off of Airbnb returns. Um, I lived in that property. I no longer live in that property. I'm concerned that your legislation is gonna phase me out. Um, I'm concerned that should the sunset clause happen, rents are gonna go up in that primary house because I'm no longer able to get the total revenue that I get from the 400 square feet in the back that covers my mortgage. Um, the point I'm trying to make is your legislation is uh, cutting with a, a broad knife or whatever the metaphor would be, it, it's clumsy. And there are plenty of people who operate thoughtful, good Airbnbs that allow them to exist in this town. Uh, there are people who have small standalone homes, you know, oftentimes, again, small, that serve as this, the guest rooms for their community. All the neighbors stay in that Airbnb, but it is a standalone property. I'm not sure why these people shouldn't be able to operate their thoughtful business in that way. Uh, or when, basically what I'm trying to say is that 
there are many nuances that this legislation does not address, so I would encourage you to not pass this because you know, there will be victims to this, people who are going to be hurt because of uh, legislation as it's currently written. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stabler. Good evening. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, Heather Fletcher, 136 Sylvia Circle. I, I came all prepared, but you know, it's interesting as you listen, um, and it won't take me too much off script, but as you listen to other people speak, it makes you think about your own position on a certain topic. And I remember being at the planning department meeting when this was proposed, and I was in favor of it. However, the two-year sunset clause was not part of what I had been in favor of. I've had mixed feelings about it. My first instinct is it will be, it has a lot of opportunity to be um, legally problematic. But for my part, the regulation in and of itself, without that, um, is thoughtful. It does grandfather in, since we need to find a better term than that, but it is. it does keep in place those properties that were existing prior to an ordinance being passed because you shouldn't pass a law retroactively against people, especially with respect to property rights, and I am a local real estate broker. However, I am a member of this community first. And so, you know, limited housing supply, high demand, high prices. Short-term rentals are one of the, um, you know, influences of rental prices going up, but they're not the main cause. And so my take on regulating short-term rentals in this way is about moving forward, not going back and punishing people who are already operating lawfully. Um, so I would encourage you to pass the regulation without the sunset clause if you're allowed, as I am in my historic preservation commissions, to remove a condition from something being proposed. And then in closing, I just want to say that, um, because this for me is more of an issue, in addition to the regulation of short-term rentals, um, further zoning reforms are needed. Mm. And I would encourage you all, this body, to revisit the 2019 alternative housing study performed by the planning department staff and begin to adopt some of those recommended zoning changes. Because although short-term rental regulation is an important change to our zoning, forgive the metaphor, but it is akin to a co making a cosmetic update when our zoning standards need a structural renovation mm. in order to fully address the housing crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fletcher. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Hillary Rustin, and I live at uh, 145 Millage Terrace. I'm going to speak uh, from the opposite point of view. But first of all, the thank you so much for all the work that you have been doing for more than the two years in addressing these issues. And, and um, particularly, I'll, I'll start with zoning, because our zoning code does say the purpose for a single family residential district is, and this is straight from the code, the purpose of the RS district is to stabilize and protect the owner occupied housing characteristics of the district and to promote and encourage a suitable environment for family life. So I feel like that's an important standard that you all have um, voted in and uh, protects neighborhoods and communities with families, those that where people can afford to live ideally, um, and that that is encroached on when there's alternate uses to that, which I think that the short-term rental, um, maybe not, I mean, I understand it's a very difficult situation, but the ones that are greater than, uh, you know, living in somebody's ADU or in somebody's house. I think I, I strongly support that. I think that's a positive thing. We do have home businesses as part of our single family zoning. Somebody can have six children during the day through a family care, and it's a limited amount of time, and, you know, traffic is also considered in that process. And it seems to me that we don't allow somebody to have seven children. It's shocking that somebody can have 30 people, 15 cars, loud parties, you know, 48 hours. And I know that the, that may be a minority, but there are still many people that are complaining and experiencing nuisance. I'm not. I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of other people. We have good um, folks that live in their home and rent a room surrounding us on two sides, and it helps them pay their mortgages. They're retired. I'm, I, I'm definitely supportive of that use. It's the out-of-town owners, the entities, or people who are not um, available to respond as 
obviously the people, the nice people that have spoken before me care about their properties and care about their neighborhoods. That's different than um, the concerns that you know we have for other neighbors that are really suffering. Um, so I, I know I come from a community originally where they have zoning that allows for short-term rentals, but not in single-family neighborhoods. And I feel that that's an important place to distinguish um, the work. I think that these ordinances have passed throughout the country without the lawsuits. So I feel like it, you know, I did some research and I've tried to reach out to the lawyers and to um, folks here to see what kind of lawsuits that have actually gone forward. And I, I don't think that Thank you, Ms. Um, there's a lot. Appreciate it. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Marilyn Vickers. I live at 197 Witherspoon Court, um, a home I've owned since 1986. Uh, I speak today and I follow Hillary to support wholeheartedly the Planning Commission's proposal, including the two-year sunset provision on non-conforming short rentals, uh, short-term rentals. My concern has been for the community to be able to house those who live and work in athens Clark County. I've heard all the arguments for the rights of property owners to do what they like with their properties. However, I speak for the rights of community members, and we are often property owners as well, to expect standards to be upheld in our neighborhoods and to have the rules apply across the board. I was a practicing psychologist for 42 years in Athens. For 35 of those years, my office was in my home. Toward that end, I consulted the applicable regulations, applied for a business license yearly, and paid the fees and taxes required. I never had a problem with my business, nor did I have complaints registered against my business. I want to see those same standards applied to short-term rentals. From what I've heard at these meetings, there seem to be few complaints registered against the short-term rentals that are owner-occupied and or supervised, which is what most of the people have talked about. The complaints come from residences that are not owned by, uh, occupied by owners or renters on a long-term basis. They sit empty some of the time, and when occupied, it is often by people who come from out of town and have no investment in the community. Sure, they go to a few restaurants, but there's no real investment. No one is easily available when there is a problem. No one is accountable. At the same time, athens Clark County has a housing shortage of homes to buy and to rent on a long-term basis for those who wish to live and work in Athens. It's a pretty great place to live. I've lived here a long time. When homes are snapped up by investors who will not live and work here, it hollows out communities and changes the conditions that make a place great to live. And that is respect and genuine caring of neighbors for each other and support of the businesses and other public facilities that enhance life here. With the proposed sunset provision over the next two years, there will need to be a shift in the business model that has increasingly tilted toward these short-term rentals in real estate and development. It can tilt back toward providing sustainable housing for residents of athens Clark County without putting anyone out of business. Change is always challenging, but it is inevitable if we are to remain a viable community. I thank you for listening. I thank you for your time and your tremendous efforts here. Thank you, Ms. Vickers. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Marsha Rosenthal. I'll give you that. And I live at 161 West Cloverhurst Avenue, within easy walking distance of Five Points, the Coliseum, and the Stadium. In other words, a neighborhood that is most attractive to short-term rentals. As I walk my dog twice a day, I see a neighborhood that is already being exploited by out-of-town owners as a business investment. This is a single-family zoned neighborhood and should be protected with some kind from these commercial uses. One house belonged uh, to a long-term family uh, uh, friends who passed away, and this, their house is now an Airbnb. Now neighbors no longer live there, but a parade of temporary renters. I begin to wonder how we can attract families to our neighborhood 
if there is a domino effect and one after another property sells to investors. We are seeing this happen in other cities, and now it is happening here. About five years ago, I went to Quebec City with my grandson and stayed in an Airbnb in Old Town. I spoke with a local resident who said that many restaurant workers used to live in Old Town, but now their apartments had been made into Airbnbs. If we are concerned about affordable housing shortage in Athens, we don't need to make it easy for investors to buy properties for STRs. I was in Albuquerque for a wedding several years ago, and my brother-in-law rented a very, very large house to house five families. It had a swimming pool, uh, tennis, and a putting green. It looked pretty luxurious from the outside, but it was a bit worn on the inside. It looked like it had, been, had too many bachelor parties. <laughs> I can imagine this could happen in our neighborhood, and I don't want to have a bachelor party next door. I appreciate your efforts to regulate short-term rentals and would like to see the proposed regulations passed. My hope is that this will stop out-of-town investment investors from seeing Athens as easy pickings. Uh, and we are, because we don't have the regulations. We need stable neighborhoods lived in by athens Clark County residents. We need more family housing in Athens, and every STR takes one more family home off the market. Every non-owner occupied STR is a hole in the fabric of a neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Good evening. Good evening. My name's Don Hayes. I live at 576 Emmett Drive in Dalton, Georgia. So I suppose I'm the devil in the room. Mm. But uh, nonetheless, my family and I, my wife and I both attended the University of Georgia. Our daughter just graduated from vet school this spring, and our son intends on enrolling in the fall. So we were able to purchase a vacation home here, much like many people purchase a vacation home at the beach or the lake. We enjoy Athens. We enjoy coming down here and enjoying the events at the University of Georgia. Uh, <clears throat> we have our home here, and it allows us to do that. We pay our taxes. We're tax-paying citizens just like the residents of Athens. We pay property taxes and everything that, that is paid here, plus we pay into the hotel motel tax. Uh, we're trying to contribute. We keep our house in tip-top condition. We're in constant competition. I'm not going to allow anybody to come into my home. I consider it just as much my home as the home that I live in Dalton, Georgia. And I'm not going to allow them to destroy it, annoy my neighbors, be a nuisance to the county. Uh, what we find is our tenants tend to be families. They come in. They visit their student. We've had people come in and have Thanksgiving dinner at our home with their student, bring the whole family in. And that's just something you can't do at a hotel. Uh, we contribute by hiring local people. We hire local housekeepers. We hire local yard maintenance. We hire local home maintenance. And that's also something that you're not going to really find with the hotel motel industry. And these people depend on us. So I'm going to be brief and just tell you that uh, I would appreciate you reconsidering. Uh, it's very important to us. We would love to hold on to our home. We don't want to become a long-term renter. We want to be able to enjoy our, our vacation home. It's our investment. But moreover, it's a place that we enjoy and we love. And we do truly love this community. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Tom Rogers, live at 245 Westview Drive in Athens. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the commission. Uh, my wife and I own one short-term rental. It's in the Five Points area. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how you look at it, I was a lawyer for 46 years, and now I'm a recovering lawyer. And uh, so I'm going to mention just two legal issues, and then I'll sit down. And, and uh, David Ellison uh, touched on these earlier, but one is the owner-occupied requirement. 
The owner occupied requirement <coughs> means that these short term rentals in, in single family residential districts uh, can only be owned and operated by a resident of Athens Clark County. That means if you live outside of Athens Clark County, you can't have one of those. If you live out of state, you can't have one of those. That is going to be a, a direct, on its face, violation of the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. The same ordinance dealing with owner-occupied in the city of Austin, Texas, was thrown out by a federal court saying it violated the Commerce Clause and was invalid. Uh, so I want to point that out. Let's, and let's take the extreme example. Let's say the Georgia legislature came out and said only Georgia residents can own land in the state of Georgia. Do you think that would hold up in court? Of course not. Uh, and this, this is just a smaller example of the same principle. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it, it violates the Commerce Clause, and that's got to be corrected. The other is the 24-month issue, and it, it's still an ex post facto law or retroactive law, which violates both the Georgia and the U.S. Constitution. There are prohibitions on uh, retroactive laws, so that, that can't be done either. So I would just point out there are, there are other constitutional issues that need to be addressed, but again, I think, uh, and, and people that are, uh, that are impacted by parties or parking or noise or whatever, there's got to be a resolution of that, but I don't think we have to do the whole, throw the whole short-term rental business out the window on this. So that's my only point to make. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Clint Moore. Um, I, uh, um, I, I, I sent an email to the Mayor and Commission uh, th this week, and I, I won't uh, really um, add anything to that. Uh, there, um, but, but I do want to say that uh, there, there are two um, uh, non-owner occupied short-term rentals on my block, and then one of them is across the, the, the street from me. And um, one thing that hasn't really um, been um, hasn't come out in the in the discussion tonight is the is the fact is to me it's instructive to look at comments left by uh, uh, occupants of, of of these short term rentals. So when they come into town and they stay and they leave, they'll leave comments that um, so many of them speak to the. Um, uh, how they they enjoyed the, the the property because it was quiet it was peaceful uh, it was friendly and it felt safe well where where do those attributes come from who who brings those attributes to that property that that the uh, that, uh, that that the clients can enjoy that well it's the residents of of a stable community that's who brings it and um, uh, you know, um, I, I've, I've, I've gleaned these comments from 138 different uh, rental parties staying at the house across the, the street from me. And while they're enjoying these attributes, I feel that um, uh, 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 my, my privacy is, 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 is uh, invaded. Um, my safety sure, uh, uh, my fears for safety sure have increased with, you know, 138 parties of randos, you know, coming through. You know, who's going to who's gonna know if they're going to take a domestic dispute out to, into the street? Anyway, our, my, anxiety, my anxiety level increases every time a new, uh, the, a new party turns over. Um, but so while that's happening, an owner three time zones away from me is reaping the profits of these attributes that me and my neighbors have built into the community. So I, I, don't, I don't see where the parity is in that <coughs> I and my neighbors have to, have to suffer a reduced quality of life so that uh, a, a property owner 3,000 miles away can, uh, can, can monetize those attributes. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Good evening. Hi. I'm Mary Moore. I live at 228 Parkway Drive. And I wasn't going to speak tonight. I've spoken to some of you already, and I've spoken at meetings already. But there's one thing that I wasn't hearing until just a few people ahead of me that I wanted to say. And this is not for the, the people who have an accessory dwelling unit or a basement or garage apartment that they 
they rent on a short term or maybe a room or two in their house. I'm not speaking to that situation. But whether you're a mile away or a thousand miles away, for these standalone houses in a neighborhood is just, that's what I want to speak to tonight, is, is that situation. People have said tonight that these people aren't going to interact with the neighbors. They just want to go downtown and spend money. Don't we want that to happen? Or think about the tourists that you know you can have that won't, that won't stay in hotels. We're talking about neighborhoods, and that's a term that hasn't been emphasized enough in this discussion. Somebody ahead of me said it very well that when you put one of these houses, when you take it off the real estate market for a home occupied owner or off the long-term rental market, you poke a hole in the fabric of that neighborhood. And we have seen holes pop up all over our two or three block neighborhood where we don't know who's coming in on any random day and, and what they're going to bring to our neighborhood. They like to, um, you know, they want to party with us. They want to, they want to be our friend. They want to pretend that they're part of the neighborhood but they bring absolutely nothing to the neighborhood. It's not somebody I can call when a fire alarm goes off or when um, a smoke detector goes off in a house. Um, I don't know their pets. Their pets upset other pets in the neighborhood. These are little tiny microaggressions that I think get left unsaid when you're talking about people's right to own property. People do have the right to own property. They have the right to rent property. And this ordinance allows them to rent property on a long-term basis, so they're not losing that, that right. So I just urge you to please support this um, ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Good evening. Hello, my name is Ken Copes. I live at 283 Terra Way. Um, I think I'm one of the folks, I, I haven't read the full ordinance, so I, I've heard all the discussions. I do think it's probably important to uh, have some type of um, understanding that it, um, somebody in a different state or a different country buys up several houses and just rents them out there. That's always an issue. And I think it could, should be addressed. I'm coming from a point of, I don't live in this house that I have owned for over 30 years, 100% of the time now. But I'm there every week, and I stay there every week. So I just want to say from my perspective, when I've heard people talk about um, this is going to be some limitations, um, it's taken my wife and I a couple of years to pick at renovating our house to be able to rent it on weekends for a graduation, a music festival, or football game. And we have another house in the country we would stay at while that's rented. I hope this is not affected by that. Um, our neighbors can call us. I do think that's important. Um, I think the neighborhoods are important. So I listen to both sides of all this, um, and I, I do think an ordinance needs to be addressed so um, companies can't come in and just start buying up houses. It does affect it. Um, I'm always afraid when a house sells, I don't know who's going to move into that house. It could be a rowdy family. <laughs> <laughs> but at least it can be addressed on a front-hand, first-hand basis. Um, so um, I, I wish you all luck in figuring this out, but I do think there seems to be some issues that need to be ironed out. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coates. Good evening. The person behind me had one, too. Hi, um, my name is Kristen Sailors, and I live in Five Points. And my husband and I have an Airbnb um, on Pope Street near the Deering Street Historic District. Um, we've had this Airbnb for three years now. Um, we consider ourselves good hosts. Um, we've got close to 150 reviews. We've got 4.9 star rating. We take care of the house. We take care of our guests. Um, we also review any guests that wants to stay with us so we can look at their status from previous homes and reject people because we want our home taken care of. We don't want to have to deal with any of these phone calls I've, I've heard some people mention in their neighborhood. Um, and something I think that hasn't been addressed from listening to previous hearings is the reason sh short-term rentals 
have a place in this conversation. Hotels are not always the best fit for people. We have a mother who stayed with us on three occasions. Her daughter is a UGA student. Um, she's getting chemotherapy treatments. So when she's getting those treatments, she books our house for a two to three week period while her daughter's healing and she can cook home cooked meals. She can take care of her, do laundry, and she just has to walk from the driveway to our front door and not have to deal with anything else that comes with a hotel. Um, we've had a professor that stayed with us. We've had several professors, but to speak to one example, um, who came in who was being requested by the theater department at UGA to help write a play, and he stayed with us for three weeks while he was undertaking that. We have a dance um, camp that the UGA um, facility puts on that they are staying with us for two to three weeks while their daughter, a 10-year-old daughter, can do that. So the point in me giving you these very specific examples, and I could give you a dozen more, um, is a hotel doesn't fit those needs all the time. And sometimes you want to be able to have those home-cooked meals because you've got an extended stay. Um, and the same thing with doing your own laundry. Everything that comes with make a home feeling like a home. Um, the the woman who is coming for the dance comp or the dance camp, it's her second time staying with us, and they call our house Grandma's House um, because they've really liked staying at us, and we have repeat guests and all this. So I understand the concern um, for neighborhoods and having – you know, any I, I I know there's always bad eggs. You're always going to have the problem children, and those are the the voices I think that get heard the loudest. So I'm just here to give a voice to the other side. I think there does there do need to be regulations and some kind of monitoring of this. I think that makes complete sense so that people on both sides of this um, can have can feel settled with it, um, but we, we, you know, it wouldn't be our primary residence, so that two-year or the sunset clause, would we would be out of that. But um, I hope you all reconsider this and just add some additional nuances before this is approved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sailors. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me again. And... Uh, my name is Sue Stevenson, and I live on Witherspoon Road, the corner of Witherspoon Court and Witherspoon Road. And I promised my son I would be quiet tonight and not talk, but I can't control myself. So uh, I'm sort of speaking for five points, because that is where I've always lived for 50 years in different, four different places. And uh, I want to ask you to follow the money, okay? And I want to tell you there's been 15 years of no decision on this, and you need to deal with this finally, you know. Anyone of any color, race, yellow, black, purple can move into five points. All you got to do is buy the house. But it is money that's driving this, okay? It is real estate agents that are conglomerates. It is out-of-state out of people. I don't think we have a problem with the on-site owners, but we sure do with these out-of-state ones. Mm -hmm. They're coming from all over the world, even out of the country. So do something to stop it. Um, I have a VBRO in my backyard. I've got gravel running down the, all through my yard, which they picked up the big pieces, and there's millions of little pieces. Uh, it's a single-family neighborhood, and uh, everyone makes investments. If anyone's ever had any stock, you lose money. Okay, that can happen. But those are the choices people made. Um, okay, put some teeth into this law. Don't get, don't get wimpy with it. Do something that'll work. There was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal about Florence, Italy. Any of you have been to this beautiful city? There are so many VBROs now in Florence that the Italians are moving out. Is that what you want, okay? Because that's what you've got set up, so do something. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson. Good evening. How are you doing tonight? Good evening. My name is Alina Marilyn. I live at 253 West Park Drive. I'm a, I'm a real estate broker who operates a successful minority-owned business specializing in short-term rental management. Over the past three years, we have demonstrated our ability to effectively manage short-term rentals, contributing positively to our community and economy. Tonight, I'm here to address the proposed two-year sunset clause in the new, order, in the new proposed ordinance. I believe, the I believe this clause, as it's written, can negatively impact our business and the livelihood of those who depend on it, such as cleaners, handymen, and, local, and other local businesses. Our track records not only shows our business, our business, ooh, our track record not only shows our businesses our business success, but also the positive impact we've had on the local economy. 
Short-term rentals have become a crucial part of the tourism industry, being, bringing in visitors who support local businesses, restaurants, and shops. Additionally, the property owners who we additionally the property owners who we work with aren't just investing in their homes, but they're investing in our community. The, their commitment to the local area goes beyond individual properties, individual properties contributing to the overall well-being of our neighborhood. Our business has created opportunities. Our business has created job opportunities and actively participated in promoting community events and initiatives. I'm asking the city to think about the broader impact, the, the broader impact of the proposed sun, sunset clause. Instead of, putting on, instead of putting on restrictions, I suggest we work together to find a solution that addresses concerns while allowing responsible short-term rental businesses like mine to contribute, to keep contributing positively to our community. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Good evening. Hello. Um, my name is Krisha Ara, and I live at 127 Herman Street. Um, I'm speaking uh, in strong support of short-term rental regulation, uh, regulation in Athens. As you know, in terms of STR regulation, Athens has been behind the curve. We have already <coughs> waited too long. Regulation is much needed to balance the housing needs of our community with the economic benefit to hosts using services like Airbnb and Verbo. I appreciate all the work that has gone into creating regulation for Athens, and I hope you will support this vital effort. Southeastern cities with a lot of tourism, like Asheville, Atlanta, Charleston, Nashville, New Orleans, and Savannah have regulated STRs in response to the obvious impact on local housing and other related issues. Athens is absolutely a tourist city, as I can firmly vouch from my personal hosting experience. I, I'm sorry. I have long been a top local Airbnb host, renting a private room collect, connected to my home for years. I love offering a welcoming spot in my artistic home for visitors to my hometown. People who come to Athens for uh, conferences, concerts, and many other reasons, and um, no, none of my neighbors have complained. I'm grateful for the benefits of Airbnb hosting as someone who uses the platform as it was originally intended. The modest supplementary income has allowed me to work more comfortably as an artist with more financial security. At the same time, there are serious issues caused by STRs that have impacted not only Athens, but communities all around the world. This is truly a global issue. Thanks for supporting serious STR regulation. Athens needs it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ara. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Good evening, y'all. Um, my name's Joe Levine. I live at 464 Forest Heights Drive. Um, and I'm also here to support the regulation of short-term rentals. Um, first, I'll just echo what uh, Miss Marilyn Vickers came up here and, and talked about. I thought that was a really beautiful comment um, and just emphasizing us um, in Athens caring about each other, um, the people in our community who who live and work here um, and who are invested um, uh, in, in living here. Um, I have personally seen in my day-to-day -day job um, how hard it is for people with low income to, to find housing. Um, people who've lived in Athens for, for many years um, and are priced out and um, you know ultimately have to move outside of Athens to to live um, and um, you know we we all know that short-term rentals um, you know they take away the housing stock um, and so I think this is just a really thoughtful um, piece of legislation. I applaud the, the Planning Commission uh, for the, the job that they did on this. Um, and this is something that also came from the Mayor and Commission um, that's been looked at for many years. 
Um, I think it's, you know, pretty much a no-brainer. Um, and, um, yeah, I just really hope that you all will support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Levine. Good evening. Getting my three-minute timer going. Mm -hmm. I'm Richard Davis. I'm at 84 Venita Drive, Unit D. I moved to Athens in July 2022 to open one specific short-term rental, and I have given my heart and soul to it to the point of bursting into tears in public places just because aside from, you know, going maybe $100,000 into debt when I, I didn't have much money, I was a tutor before that, um, the personal investment that goes into loving each guest who comes into Athens to interviewing each guest who comes in to make sure they understand how important it is to be courteous to my neighbors, to make sure they understand to drive safely on that road and to tell everybody in their group to drive safely on that road, uh, to be available to check in on my cameras to make sure that there are not noise problems going on late at night, to turn away guests who I think might cause a noise problem. I turned away two groups just today. Um, this has been extreme effort, but I do it because it is a beautiful property. I have people come in whose sons have died and whose mothers have outlived them. They need a place for grandma. Someone said bullshit in the audience. If someone wants to talk to me, I can get those guests' names, and if they're willing, I can share them, not without them. Anyway. Anyway, so you know they need a place to gather together. Now, I want to make a constructive suggestion here. This extreme ordinance isn't going to fly, but something has to be done. So let's do what Tybee Island does. If there is a property that has a verified, police verified with video, severe noise disturbance, find them. Increase the fine each time it happens. After a certain number, I think five is reasonable of, within a certain period, suspend them for 12 months. If they come back online, which they probably won't, and it happens again, shut that property down. This will specifically shut down the like five to 10 properties in Athens that are causing 98% of the problem, and it won't hurt the investors who have tried desperately hard to be good to their neighbors. Now, I have one other suggestion that is even more radical and has not been mentioned. I loved what Mr. Moore said, actually. I think STRs benefit because of their neighbors. So what would be fair would be to cause those very neighborhoods, the people who live right next door and in that subdivision, to benefit from the STR. And it is easy to do this. We have a tracking procedure of how much tax each SDR pays. So set aside a commensurate amount of money to invest right into that neighborhood, right into that local school district. Give the next door neighbors a break on their property taxes. Now this won't solve anything, but it will give the neighbors something, something substantial. And I mean, nothing else, nothing that doesn't actually align interests is going to work. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Davis. I'm going to remind those gathered in the chamber tonight that we're here to quietly listen to those at the podium. I appreciate that very much. Hi. Evening. My name is uh, Dan Lorenz. I emailed you guys. I live at 157 Grady Avenue. I emailed you guys earlier about this. I, I'm standing here in support of the short-term regulation. Um, I think it's important to remember that this regulation, whatever form it takes eventually, is not going to ban STRs. Um, my wife's family rented our, a house across the street from us once. It was great to have they done. I had a friend who stayed at uh, one of Sam Stabler's places who, who, who talked earlier, and that, that, that worked out well. Um, so it's really nice to have these STRs around. Um, but I, I am worried that if we do nothing to um, keep seeing more and more houses in the neighborhood become empty of actual neighbors, um, it's really going to potmark the, the neighborhoods. Um, and so I, so I think some regulation that controls a number of these is, is clearly needed. And I, I really hope you guys move forward on this, on this uh, in some fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lorenz. Good evening. Uh, hi there, Scott Nesbitt, uh, 280 Terra Way, uh, and I'm here to speak in favor of the uh, of the regulation. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I want, just want to be clear: we need housing. Uh, Athens, as is well known, has a housing crisis, and it's been featured twice in the New York Times in the past year and a half uh, for that fact. 
um, in 2022 as the community uh, that was the that has flipped most egregiously in the entire nation from one with plenty of housing to one without enough and again recently uh, how college towns are being squeezed by short-term rentals. Every short-term rental property is one property where an Athenian cannot live. They constrain our housing supply. They're not the only thing that constrains it, but they are a significant constraint. The data are clear. Short-term rentals are bad for communities. The fair market rent of an efficiency apartment in athens Clark County increased 23% from 2023 to 2024. As for a measure of home sales prices, the Federal Reserve House Price Index for athens Clark County increased 56% from third quarter 2020 to uh, third quarter 2023. This policy that uh, the, planning, uh, the Planning Commission came up with is supported by significant study and research. I don't believe that any more research is necessary. We need Athens for Athenians. Look at Asheville, Charleston, and Savannah. These communities are shells of their former selves, largely because they've been hollowed out by non-residents taking up much of the existing housing. The zoning code and future land use plan claim to support and protect family life. So let's call these short-term rentals in the middle of our neighborhoods what they are, hotels. If you refuse to regulate them, you're authorizing hotels in our single family neighborhoods. This current practice does not protect family life in Athens. Please do not be cowed by manipulative threats of lawsuits. Atlanta and Savannah have passed similar regulations on short-term rentals. So can you. Thank you, Mr. Thank Nesbitt. You. Good evening. Uh, Ian Thomas, 645 Boulevard. I'm going to be very brief, which I know will upset everybody. Um, but as I was sitting here, actually a question arose. And I was wondering why, what, uh, and this is actually to the short-term rental owners as well, what benefits do you get over a short-term rental that you wouldn't get from allowing this house to be available long-term for a long-term rental? Um, and this is something to consider. I mean, maybe if you had a really good tenant, somebody that was there for a long term, you wouldn't have to worry about them kicking holes in the walls or causing problems in the neighborhood, and you might still be able to make a profit off of it. For the community, um, you know, if somebody comes in for a short-term rental, I'm sure they're going to be sending money downtown on restaurants and things. But if you have a family living there, they're going to be spending money at grocery stores over an extended period of time. We actually might make more money off of these properties as a community if we had somebody there in the long term. And that would also address some of the issues we've talked about holes in the neighborhoods. So I realize there's not gonna be one answer for everything, but um, maybe we just need to turn these short-term rentals into long-term rentals, and everybody can be happy-ish with us. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. Good evening. Hi, my name's Kelsey Berkner, 1905 South Millage Avenue. Um, I just jotted this down while I was here. Um, I understand the housing crisis that people are facing, facing nationwide as rates have greatly, greatly sorry, increased over the past few years. Short-term rentals by private owners, not large corporations, are not the cause of the housing crisis. I understand the housing crisis personally as I grew up with housing insecurity and lived in a camper in high school. I've worked since I was in high school. I put myself through school to become a nurse. I saved and bought my first home here in Athens. I lived there for three years and now I rent it out as a short-term um, rental for extra income. I work full-time as a nurse. I have a part-time job as a nurse and I have this extra to supplement my income. <sighs> All that to say, I'm asking you to vote this down, um, vote down the sunset laws. Please do not put restrictions on property that people like myself at the Nance have worked very hard for um, and do make extra money off of. I'm not a big corporation. I'm just a 32-year-old trying to make a little extra money. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bertner. Good evening. How are you guys? I'm Patrick McShane. I'm a Jackson County resident, also a real estate developer. So I get to go in front of, you know, planning commissions, mayors, uh, probably more often than I, than I care to, but have properties in Florida, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, all over the place. 
I think when these things come up, there's unintended consequences with whatever you do, right? I mean, whichever way you go with this, there's going to be unintended consequences. You're going to have people mad one way or the other. So I'm going to come out in favor of banning off street parking, noise, shortage of housing. I'm in favor of all these things. So I think we should ban student housing in Athens because I think students are the biggest proponent of all street parking, noise violation, and the shortage of housing in Athens. I think that's really what's driving the issue. So, you know, I would say as 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 opposed to banning short term rentals, let's just let's just ban all student housing because I think those items actually are bigger detriments to the housing crisis in Athens. Um, and you know, I was sitting here listening to it. Um, you know, my wife's from Athens. I have family in Five Points, but listening to people in Five Points talk about affordable housing and taking away the opportunity for those people that are trying to carve out a living or afford their rents, that's not really lost on me. So. You know, I would, I would just say keep that in mind that there are unintended consequences whichever way you go with this. Um, from a tax perspective, I own a property in South Carolina, I pay $22,000 per year in property taxes on a 4,800 square foot building. The reason for that is there's no industry there, there's no housing, there's, there's really no tax base. So you start taking away your tax base, you know, the classic center doing a big renovation over there. I would consider that as you, as you go into what kind of revenue issues you're going to run into if you get rid of some of these short-term uh, short rentals. Like I said, you know, ultimately it's your decision, but I would just consider uh, the unintended consequences whichever way you go. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. McShay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Elise Stengel. I live at 235 River Hill Drive. Um, I am a native Athenian, so I have seen it, you know, change over the years. And I am here tonight to ask y'all to support this amendment on short-term rentals. I do want to thank you all for all the hard work that's gone to, into this over the years and, well, and past months. And for listening for everyone here tonight, it's definitely a crowd-drawing issue. Um, I think this is a carefully crafted specifically to target out-of-town investors, absentee landlords, not people trying to make some extra money who rent out their home on, on game day weekends. Um, and those people will still be able to operate short-term rentals. Uh, we've heard a lot tonight from people who talk about how it would work in an ideal world, but we do not unfortunately live in an ideal world where that works because we have had We've heard complaints over and over from people dealing with these issues. Um, two years is not immediately. That still gives people some time. This is not a new issue. It's been in the works for a while. Um, and we have this problem now. So grandfathering in the people who are currently causing issues seems like it kind of misses the point. Uh, but my main concern is that Athens is suffering from a lack of affordable housing. As someone who works in social services in town, basically an apartment becomes open when another family gets evicted. There is just not enough housing here in town now. Um, and that puts constant burden on the social service agencies trying to support these families because um, the housing stock is not, not there. Uh, Long-term rentals gives local families a place to stay. It provides neighbors and communities and the, the community feel that we treasure about Athens. Um, should these people who currently uh, manage Airbnbs decide to shift to long-term rentals, I promise they would be snapped up. Uh, there is a vast need for housing that's not being addressed for local families who live and work here. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stengel. Good evening. Hi. My name is Linda Wright, and I live at 260 Southview Drive. Um, I am in support of this um, ordinance for short-term rentals. As other people have said, I think it messes up our neighborhoods besides taking away housing from families. Uh, Single-family residents mean single family in a house. Um, I know the gentleman was probably joking about college students, but again, 
single family in a house. No more than two college students is supposed to happen. That We already have that rule. It is not enforced. People here are mentioning lawsuits that might be brought up because you allow or stop short-term rentals. There is a lawsuit in front of this group right now concerning college students in single-family housing, more than two. Maybe the short-term rentals, I don't think the sunset provision is even needed. They've been in violation all along, unless they've just been renting to two unrelated people in their short-term rentals. So I don't think they need grandfathered because they've been breaking the law already. I am in great support of, of this plan. I think it's a, a great, and I appreciate the effort that the planning committee went in trying to resolve this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. All right. Uh, with uh, all members of the public uh, who are interested in having spoken on this matter, I uh, will move to commission discussion. And um, I'm just going to ask Attorney Drake to read the ordinance, so we've done that for the record at the outset here. An ordinance to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to short-term rentals and for other purposes. Uh, thank you, Attorney Drake. I appreciate that. All right. I'd like to begin just by asking a commissioner to place a motion on the table. Commissioner Fisher. Yes. Um, I will make a motion to deny and recommend, pursuant to Section 943 of the Zona Ordinance of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, that this go back to the Planning Department for further revisions to propose short-term rental zoning ordinance related to the concerns expressed by our community. All right. Thanks, Commissioner Fisher. There's a motion to deny and send back to the Planning Commission. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right. We've got a second from Commissioner Culpepper. Um, do you want to speak to the motion? Yes. Um, you know, tonight we have heard so many, um, some for, some against, and I think we need, really need to take the advice of our legal counsel who we depend on a lot. Um, regardless, when I was elected to this office, one of the things I said I was going to try to really protect how we spend our money. Now, do we as a community, if we go into a litigation, do we want to spend that money on outside um, counsel probably to fight a lawsuit that we don't have to fight? That's why I recommend that we send this back to the Planning Commission, let them revise it, let it come before us again sometime in April for a work session, and we vote on it in May. To me, that makes sense. And hopefully, we'll come up with something that, again, we're not going to please everyone, but I think we can get away from these lawsuits, put something in place that hopefully, that we, you know, we can satisfy the majority of our community. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Major Williams, did staff want to speak to, to, to an element of this? Just to be clear, and, and it was in the motion, I heard you clarify it, but it would go to the Planning Commission and not the Department. That, that would be two different things. You'd be looking for staff for recommendation on text amendments, but I think the intent is that it goes back to the commission, Planning Commission for reconsideration. Yes. Thank you. For, for an alternate recommendation. Commissioner Culpepper? Yeah, so I want to be clear. I do support uh, an ordinance regulating uh, short-term rentals, but I can't uh, support um, this ordinance in its version. Um, you know, we hire the county attorney to protect us uh, and make recommendations from potential legal liability. Our attorneys have advised us uh, against adding the sunset clause into this, and as Stuart, like Dexter said, as stewards of our taxpayer monies, I don't think it's responsible, uh, I think it's irresponsible for us to expose ourselves to um, unnecessary liability and expenses trying to defend this. Um, also, if you look at the notes from the Planning Commission meeting, um, it was asked, um, when staff was asked for data on the scope of the problem of nuisances and complaints, staff stated they have no, no such data. So how can we create an effective ordinance without having the data? I recommend that we get the data first and then try to create something that we can regulate and restrict short-term rentals. We can't do that without the, having the data. And also, the reality is we've heard several times that uh, there will be lawsuits filed. So in reality, if this goes to, um, if it gets hung up in the courts, lawsuits are filed, it gets hung up in the courts, that can be 12 to 24 months. We cannot control that timeline. Let's send it back to the Planning Commission where we can control the timeline and get this thing right the first time versus passing something 
and just hoping that, you know, we're opening ourselves up to all kind of financial obligations trying to defend it. Uh, others speaking to the motion? Uh, oh. Commissioner Thornton. Um, I, I, I think that, and I promised I wasn't going to say it, up, <laughs> but I think that um, we, heard, we heard another side that we never heard before. Um, and I think the sunset, I think people were okay with the regs. I think, I know me personally, I do think that the sunset uh, piece has made me uh, rethink some things. The other thing I, I, I think, um, and maybe he did say it jokingly, but short-term rentals, I, let me go on record. I do not support absentee land, uh, landlords housing here. I do not support that. Do not. I understand community. I understand neighborhood. I understand um, folks like to know who their neighbors are, who their dog, you know, whose little dog is running up and down the street. I don't know how we can go back, but we created, a, somebody created this thing of Athens being a tour, tourist place. Somebody did, it wasn't me, okay? And now we're trying to put the brakes on it, okay? Because we're accomplishing what somebody created or somebody envisioned, Athens being a tourist place. And we did a good job on that. But we did not think about the collateral damage that was going to impact neighbors when we came up with this. I'm going to support um, um, Commissioner Fisher's motion, but I'm supporting it for the neighborhoods and the community. I'm supporting it from what we heard tonight because that and you were not calculated into this equation of a tourist place. I think if it goes back, and we're not talking about another two years. We're talking about this coming in May. In May. In May. In May. We should be able to come out. We won't, won't please all of y'all. Some of y'all are not going to be pleasable. But, um, but, but we will make the best effort to make sure that you're figured into the equation. I, I love what I heard tonight from both sides. I never thought about jobs that some of these short-term rentals were creating. I never thought about that. The other thing, uh, I'm on yellow. Um, I am very concerned when we have a group of people that y'all can attack me all day long on social media. Y'all can do that all day long. That's what I signed up for. But you have had people that have attacked short-term rental landlords. And that's not right. Commissioner, I'm, I'm through. Let me move on to the next one. Commissioner Myers. Yeah. I'd like to make a substitute a motion to approve the uh, ordinance as is. I'll second, second. it. Okay. All right. And you can speak to that. Yes. Um, I've prepared some notes here. Um, I support this ordinance as presented this <coughs> evening, but I, I will ask that if approved, the mayor directs that in a year's time the ordinance be reviewed to assess the data captured and suggest revisions to the present language. But let me speak right now to the importance of the ordinance itself. As we've heard tonight, our zoning codes state that the purpose of the single family RS district is to stabilize and protect the owner occupied housing characteristics of the district and to promote, encourage a suitable environment for a family life. The ordinance then goes on and lists the, what kind of activity is allowed in RS zones. And that's not much. Not allowed are hotels, motels, bed and breakfasts, group personal care homes, boarding houses, dormitories, bakeries, kennels, and vehicle repair businesses. STRs are not on that list because platforms like Airbnb and Verbo didn't used to exist. Thus, the STRs in the single family zones are a kind of loophole that exists because our county, like those across the country, has not caught up with online book booking platforms like Airbnb and Verbo. We are now trying to enact local legislation that addresses this. 
We are not simply creating legislation because of a few bad apples. We are enacting legislation that allows commercial STRs in many different land zones, but not in single family areas because of its effect on the integrity of those neighborhoods. As is, our present SR single family zoning creates neighborhoods for our residents to live in. And, and there are a short list of home occupations that are allowed, like in-home daycares, uh, up to six, one chair beauty salons, and animal grooming for up to two animals. By allowing residents who live in their homes to run a home occupation STR, we're just adding to that list. So moving forward, the drafted ordinance addresses many problems with STRs in single family areas. But right now, the biggest challenge is how to deal with the ones already existing. For those being run in owner-occupied or rental <laughs> residences, all they'll have to do is apply for a home occupation li license like those daycares and beauty salons. But for the STRs and single-family neighborhoods being run as investment properties, it's a different issue. They exist because of that loophole previously referred to. They just do not fit the definition of what is envisioned in the definition of a single-family neighborhood. It seems reasonable that people who already own second homes for short-term rentals should be given a couple of years to transition um, into longer-term rentals as the sunset provision allows. That's fair. But giving them an endless time to keep running is not fair to everyone else living in single-family phones. Commissioner, zones. your time's expired. I'm going to uh, move on to... Mr. Mayor, if my colleagues agree, I'd like to request uh, for one more minute. I agree. Uh, common consent, an additional okay. minute for, for Commissioner Myers. I agree. Okay. When those standalone STRs return to the market for homeowners and renters, we'll be making steps to addressing our housing shortage. Yesterday on Airbnb uh, in late April, Monday to Wednesday, there were 546 homes that could house four more people. And just as many, if not more, were in East Athens and in Five Points. Meanwhile, on Zillow, there are only 304 total houses at any sale point. The bottom line is that people who live in single families, uh, residents, or zoned areas have rights and investments too. Commercial and industrial zoned areas are for commerce and making money. Neighborhoods are for neighbors. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Link is seconder. I'm going to go ahead and uh, yeah, recognize um, you next, and then I have uh, three others on tap. Commissioners Davenport, Hamby, and Hool. I just want to um, emphasize that um, this does not prohibit anyone, regardless of what zone you live in, from renting out a tiny house in your backyard or a garage or basement apartment or a room or two in your house or even the whole house if you want to get away on game day weekends and make some money off your home. It does not prevent that. Um, if you live in your home and you have a homestead exemption in your home, you can do with it as you please. This applies to those investment properties only. Um, I, I believe there is some place in single family neighborhoods for these STRs, but I believe that it should be very, very strictly re regulated. And, and maybe what we need to do is come up with a special use permit process for those particular properties. But in the time being, we've got to put the cork in the bottle. Um, I'm a, I was on the committee that first started looking at STRs about five years ago. We initially started looking at them purely so we could assure that we are collecting appropriate taxes from this business. Um, and I think there were about 300 existing in Athens then. When we started looking at it again to come up with some kind of regulation, um, I, that had doubled to about 600 and now we're up to over, over 1,000 in, in the past two years or so. Um, it's taken two years for those recommendations that we formed in the Government Operations Committee to get to where they are right now, where they might actually get implemented. That's how slow government moves. Um, we had to get money in the budget to pay for this officer, this compliance officer that we're planning on hiring. We had to put it through the planning department and through the planning commission. Um, so we have been thinking about this for a long time, but it moves really, really slow. We send it back to planning. I'm not sure how quickly it'll it'll move. I, I would think that once that compliance officer is hired, they would be able to gather the data so we can tweak this ordinance and craft something that perhaps is a little more perfect than what we have, but we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, you know, this is a problem that has been snowballing for years now, and we've got to get it under control. Um, I noticed that in the ordinance, and this I guess is a question for the attorney, um, there's mention of a special use permit. 
as, as part of that, that properties that comply with a special use permit would be allowed. Is there anything in the ordinance that dictates a STR going through a special use permit process? Because I couldn't like match that mention of special use permit with. Uh, Mr. Lani wants yeah, to speak to the Yeah, Bruce, maybe you can. It varies by zone how these are dealt with, and, and I would kind of reinforce there's really two categories of short-term rental here. There's, there's uh, that that can be permitted as a home occupation, and there's that that is a commercial operation. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find is by zone, there are a handful <coughs> of zones that require the commercial use, the commercial operation where, where owner occupancy isn't required to come through a special use review. Um, I believe that's the case in our AR zone, for example. Mm -hmm. um, it RM is as well, I believe. for the RM, the multifamily, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think also for the, the light industrial, the EI zone, okay. those are all special uses. Okay. I, and I, the standards I, of special uses would apply that we already have in the code. Uh -huh. So they, any of those would have to come before this body to get that permit? In those zones for commercial use. In those use, yes, particular right. zones. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. And Commissioner um, Link, I need to move on to some others, but if you have some others, we can return okay. to you for a second round. Commissioner Davenport? Yeah, I'm going to need a second round, too. Um, can Judd Drake explain the Rathcoff case? So um, one of the emails that we got said, while Georgia law provides no particular guidance on how to reasonably sunset legal non-conforming issue, Rathcoff does. That's a case in Maryland, correct? Well, I would say, is that a memo from our office or from somewhere outside? Your office. The memo we sent is attorney-client privilege, so I would need the entire body to waive the privilege okay. before I spoke so about it. I'm, I do apologize. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, would, 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 would you like discussion of that and like to ask the body to waive attorney-client privilege for discussion of Rathcoff? I would say, Mr. Mayor, we need, you know, I'm happy to do it if the body waives it, but I might, I'm going to be answering questions narrowly. Legal strategy okay. questions, yeah. you know, that... Um, I'll just say be careful when so you let's do, not that. do that. Yeah. Not, but, yeah. um, but I do want to say that we did get client privilege information that's very pertinent. And, but um, so it just makes this situation more delicate. But my, in, in our side of town, um, I do believe in protecting neighborhoods. A lot of people buy homes because they, they love, the, you know, the aesthetics of the neighborhood. They love, you know, the streets and, you know, to begin, you know, once they move in, they tend to, you know, love their neighbors. They like the kids running up and down the street, the, you know, can I borrow some sugar or, you know, the neighborly um, neighborhood. Short term rentals and single family zones, kind of like one of our um, uh, speakers said, it does poke a hole in the, those neighborhoods. Um, I, there was one house on my side of town that was highly priced. Um, for three twenty-five, it sold in um, October, not October, November last year. An outside investor purchased it for a hundred and sixteen thousand dollars more than that uh, the original mm -hmm. price. And guess what? It is now. It's a short-term rental. So we're destroying the fabric of these neighborhoods, and we're hurting the, the people who who actually want to live here. Because I guarantee you, if we it, if we eliminated short-term rentals altogether, which is you know against state law. Um, those homes will be actually bought and purchased by people who actually want to live here. I had a professor um, who lived in an apartment for 18 months. Why he looked, well, this was right during COVID, but um, he was looking, he lived, him and his wife lived in an apartment for 18 months because they could not find a reasonable, um, they cannot find reasonable housing in Nassau County. That that situation is replicated throughout throughout Nassau County where there are a lot of residents who can't find housing and short-term rentals are not helping with that situation. My time is almost up, but circle back to me. Thank you. Commissioner Hamby. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, so when I, when I first came to Athens many, many years ago, uh, I had hair and, uh, and, and, um, I've lost that. But, um, part of the discussion at that time, uh, was strong neighborhood protections and quality of life issues. And I still believe that those two remain true. And I hope that we do too, um, because I, I see this as, you know, we heard tonight about building community, building neighborhoods, building neighbors, helping neighbors. 
and certainly certainly you know short term rentals may have their place but but neighborhoods have their have, have, have their place too building community has its place too so you know the motion on the floor uh the main motion on the floor is to send it back to planning commission and i'm not sure we haven't really you know there's been no guidance given to the planning commission about what 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 you, what they what they are to do uh and you know they could very well send back the same thing that they sent to us tonight or or they could send something different there could be a, a one-year sunset clause um and and or or something something else that they put in there so i guess what i'm and you know we've heard tonight about potential lawsuits and if if we as a body <laughs> made um made our decisions based on the number of times people get up and say they're going to sue us we wouldn't make any decision y'all i mean i think if we wouldn't have a firefly we wouldn't have a greenway we wouldn't have some of the development that we've that we've rezoned we wouldn't we might not have sidewalks because we get sued a lot over people tripping on sidewalks so maybe we, we may just stop building sidewalks i think you see my point i mean we can't we can't be held hostage to something something that may happen we just have to keep moving forward and do what we think is is and what the residents are asking us to do sue stevenson's asking us to do something let's help sue Marilyn vickers um and and over on millage terrace and millage heights there's been plenty of of people that just the houses sit empty during the week while while you know they're trying to build neighborhood and build community and we ought to help that and uh so mayor i wanted to ask you you know um, the uh, substitute motion was asking to, that you assign something back to a uh, committee i don't you know planning commission i don't know what what direction we've given them so if this substitute motion passes are you i don't want to put you on the spot but sure. certainly certainly send it back to government officer no, glad RC. to speak to that so um uh i want to make two comments regarding uh, assignment to both of the bodies under discussion uh, should the substitute motion pass, my recommendation would be that um, this go to government operations. I would make that assignment so that I at a reasonable horizon, a year's time, we can evaluate the impact of this and contemplate any modifications that we would then like to route through the Planning Commission. Should the main motion pass, uh, I, I would assert that we need to give guidance to the Planning Commission. We don't need to send it back in the absence of guidance. Because what we don't want is just a ping pong ball that's going to bounce between the county commission and the planning commission. You know, we want to be very clear with the planning commission about what the modifications might be. So uh, I, I may speak to that in a little more depth uh, in, in a subsequent comment. I still had a little bit more time, I believe. Go, go right ahead. So, so I just um, in addressing that, Joe, what this what this main what this substitute motion does, it allows us to get to get moving. If we do if we do if we do the main motion then it just drags it it drags it out even further and and people are going to be impacted by it and it, op it keeps open the door you know the other potential i mean if they're going to sue us over the sunset law they might as well just sue us over the over any grandfathering thing because the way they hear them the way some of the some of the comments were that we either way we might get sued but there's also people in the community that are impacted by this that also have a right to sue and and that should be that should be something that we take into account as well if we are factoring in lawsuits but but I'm, I'm i'm trying to factor in and i hope you are too the building of neighborhoods and the building of community and let's let's keep let's keep trying to trying to work hard at doing that for for us for our, our residents and commissioner will we'll have their hand up but i've not recognized them yet go ahead thank you mayor um i have a question for the motioner of the original motion so um if Commissioner Fisher is willing to clarify. Um, is, is, am I correctly understanding that this is specifically to go to the Planning Commission for them to discuss with advisement from our attorney's office the sunset provision and possible revisions of that and then get it back to us by May, that that's yes. the focus? Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, and so then I guess I'd like to clarify with you, Mayor, would you be willing to have that kind of like specific restrictive designation with that kind of timeline given to them? I, I, yeah, I would want a quick turnaround and the provision that would necessarily have to be discussed at the planning commission level is the sunset clause. I've noted to a lot of individuals, either directly via conversation or in email, and to community groups as well, there are many, many times that I can say, I may not like the legal landscape here in the great state of Georgia, Empire State of the South. 
I mean, I like the things that uh, roll out of the gold dome or are embedded in OCGA, but I've got to be very honest about both what's in state law and also what's in subsequent case law. And case law would not support a sunset clause, certainly not a two-year, maybe not one at all. And so that's the element that would have to be discussed at the planning commission level before it returned to us. Okay, thank you. Um, I see. I see the clerk kept the light on while you were speaking. I appreciate your remarks, but I'll try to get to the rest of this in what I'm pretty sure is under the three minutes. Um, so you know, I've I've been dismayed like some of my colleagues at how long it's taken for us to get to this point. I do feel like regulation is long overdue, and I am eager to pass something. Um, but given that it's been years, I don't see three more months making an immense difference, especially if the moratorium that's subsequently on this agenda also passes, which I'm hoping and assuming it will. Um, you know, as, as multiple commenters noted, short-term rentals are not the sole problem with regard to affordable housing and a shortage of it in Athens, but they are part of the problem. And so regulating them, I think, is part of a multifaceted solution that I really think we need to do. Um, I also uh, would like to echo one commenter who, uh, who cited the 2019 report that we've had for some time. And uh, accordingly, you know, I, I hope that we will do more than just this because this is but one piece. I think we should look at accessory dwelling units again and get something on the books for that. Other infill revisions that allow density at scale. Um, other um, inclusionary zoning measures beyond what we've currently got. And as, as I've brought up many times in this body, you know, we've talked a lot about how we want to exempt uh, home or homeowners who have a, an Airbnb or an STR from these kinds of regulations. I think the same can be true for the um, definition of family. You know, we have hyper-restrictive elements that don't allow for long-term rentals. I mean, we're about to pass something that would allow for short-term rentals in places that wouldn't allow long-term rentals, which is odd to me. So, you know, we, we trust owner-occupants, I think, to take good care of the property and be responsive to their neighbors. And so I hope we could do that for more than just this. Um, uh, another commenter who I know wants to see us act tonight said, you know, we got to do something that works. And, uh, and I agree with that commenter, and it's with that in mind that I think sending this back to the Planning Commission to take one more swing at it is, is worth doing. Um, so so I, I do plan to support the original motion on the floor tonight, expecting that this will come back in May, and hoping that some kind of sunset provision, um, perhaps with some kind of relief valve in there, might be part of what we get back. And um, I right. also hope, uh, this is my last Continue remark if I thought. may, the, the light was going when you were speaking, Mr. Mayor, but uh, I, I do hope that colleagues will also support item 28 on our agenda tonight. Um, I think we need to get the ball rolling on that data collection everyone's been talking about, and having that person on board is important to do that, crucial really. Um, and I think the timing might actually work out perfect to have that person on board right around when this is coming back before us. So I do hope that while we table this, we might act on that. Thank you. Commissioner Wright. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to speak to my notable silence in this regard. Um, I am recused on this topic due to the fact that I have a rental property. And so I um, am not going to be, I'm recused, which means I'm um, not, not going to be voting or discussing um, item 25, 26, or 28. So. Thanks for the clarity. I appreciate that, Commissioner. Uh, not heard yet from Commissioner Taylor, and then I'll return to others. Um. Yeah. So thank, thank you to all the residents that came and spoke to us tonight. I know that this was going to be a hot topic. Whew, the email was on fire. Um, but <laughs> as I spoke with, you know, um, my residents, um, my constituents, as well as everyone that reached out and hearing everything that everybody had to say tonight, I just couldn't be quiet. So being born and raised in, in inner East Athens and now representing that same district and seeing a lot of the things that was spoken on tonight, I'm going to have to um, go with the second motion because my district is gentrified and it's being overrun with student housing as well as short term rentals. Right now when I go home, there are actually four houses on my street in my district that were owned by elderly African-American families who have been priced out now. Um, and so I just, I know that some people make money off of this, but we have people losing, you know, their houses. And then, you know, we can say, well, one doesn't go with the other, but it, it does. Um, one of the speakers said, follow the money. Well, they're following it to the, um, districts like mine, District 3, which is predominantly black and um, low income, low to moderate income. So, you know, we lose our housing. Then we have a different neighbor that comes and goes and does 
a lot and we have children and we have a sense of community and family so tomorrow when you decide you know to send out your emails just take into consideration that there are people hurting while you're profiting that's Got, uh, commissioner thornton and commissioner myers I did want to um, um, add to it because I, I got a little emotional on the first and um, my first statement. Um, this is so important to me now, and 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 what Commissioner Taylor has just said, because at the end of the day or the beginning of the day, this has been going on in a lot of communities in Athens but the communities didn't look like a lot of the people in this room. And um, I'm not being offensive, it's, it's reality. And now that we have a chance to get it right for all communities, I'm just saying uh, May is not that long down the road. We, it, if the mayor is willing to be very clear on directions and data, this is something that we, this is one thing that we should be able to come together on because it affects all of us. It just has affected some of us a lot longer and a lot more devastating. So yes, I do, I, I do not, I want a regulation, but I want a regulation that is not just going to say, oh, the black community, wait, this affects all of us. And I think that May is a legitimate request with clear directions and um, data and direction from the mayor. Commissioner Myers. Yeah, um, I just want to speak to the, uh, the question of the legality of this, or the not the legality, but the legal issues associated with this. And, and uh, I found some of the remarks that ma were made from our first commentator, uh, Mr. Ellison, the lawyer speaking on behalf of the STR um, owners. Um, and one of the big things here in terms of, of payback, as I understand this from his, from his letter, which is actually part of the open record, not from our attorney, mm -hmm. is, is that we're looking at the amount of time it would take to recoup your investment. And if I heard him correctly, he didn't say it's four years or five years. I believe he said like 27 years or 23, what was it? It was something along those lines, which leads me to believe that although my colleague, um, you know, Commissioner Hool is generously thinking that there's going to be some other uh, uh, amendment that's put forward, it, it's clear to me from the position that we heard at the beginning of the evening that anything that addresses the already existing STRs and limits them is not going to fly, that we're going to get a lawsuit um, on that. So, you know, my thinking here as I put forward f first, is to put this forward now. We'd have this year, we can make tweaks and find out more in another year that may be able to address some of the nuances we've talked about. I foresee from what I was told this evening by the lawyer that there's gonna be a lawsuit if we have any sunset provision on this. And I just want you all to consider this. I mean, otherwise we're repeating these whole, all these discussions and uh, again in two months and probably we'll end up with the same result um, if I was hearing correctly from the attorney when he spoke at the beginning of the evening. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, I, um, I guess for me, you know, I'm, I'm really amazed, you know, we, our colleagues, you know, we talk about things, and like I said, this has been going on for two years. Uh, th three of us get on, and you know, this is new to us, and you know, we're trying to figure out what's best for this community. And from time and time again, history has shown that we have not made wise decisions. Well, I'm trying to get all of us to understand what's wrong with at least trying to get this right. And, 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 and I get it, 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 and family and community means everything to me. I get that. But at the same time, from time to time, what I have experienced and what I have seen, when we rush things, and it's been two years, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm not sure why it took two years, but when we rush things and we don't get it right, and then if lawsuits happen, then we got to ask our taxpayers. 
And I just think for me, I'd rather not have that happen regardless of what happened. If nobody ever sues, that's great. But I just think we need to be more prudent in what we do and really think this thing through. And I don't see anything wrong with sending this back for three months. Let's have a conversation. Let's do a work session. And let's vote on it in May. And if it comes back the way it comes back, then let's make a decision. And whatever the decision be, let's stand on that and be done with it. Got uh, Commissioner Hool and Commissioner Link. Thank you, Mayor. I think this will be my, my last thoughts, but I just wanted to speak up since I was named. Uh, this, is, this is kind of, uh, this is interesting. This is fun to be debating with my colleague to my left, who I'm usually not debating with. Uh, <laughs> You know, I think it's true that we are, you know, you know, facing lawsuits is inevitable, as another colleague pointed out. You know, we face lawsuits all the time, and I don't think we should let that dictate what we do. Uh, however, I think the outcomes of litigation are not inevitable, and I think that we have a chance to strengthen this, and it's with that in mind that I think a, a reasonable, short, I mean, we're, we're naming a specific amount of time to bring this back. Um, I'd like to see what comes back. Whatever does come back, I, I am eager to support. Um, whether that includes a sunset provision or not, whether it's uh, revised substantially or minimally. Um, but I, I, I do think there is good reason to just push the pause button for a very brief period, even though I have to kind of laugh at myself for wanting to after arguing for us to get this on our agenda for years. <laughs> uh, but in this particular case, I'm, I'm hoping that we will uh, just Send it back to get it right back. A little quick boomerang. Commissioner Link. Yeah. Um, so when, when I was on the committee th that came up with the recommendations, we um, recommended to prohibit them in single-family neighborhoods because the current law prohibited bed and breakfasts and hotels. And, you know, <coughs> by those standards, in these single-family neighborhoods, they're already operating illegally, as one of our commenters pointed out. Um, and it's just been the good graces of this local government that has not gone after them under the present circumstances. Um, you know, what, what do I see is, is simply, you know, enacting that current law and allowing the Government Operations Committee to look at the current law and say, well, maybe there are some special circumstances in those single-family neighborhoods that might allow these and come up with those very special circumstances. But from what I can tell, it's already illegal. Um, you know, by definition, they're called Airbnbs. Bed and breakfasts are illegal in single-family neighborhoods. And if we want to make them legal under certain circumstances, then that's up to us to come with some, up with some specific circumstances for that. Thank you, Commissioner. Anyone else like go ahead, Commissioner Davenport? Yes. Um, so on the other part that I do have concerns about is the um, some of the information we got from our attorneys concerning um, potential lawsuit. Because I, you know, just on this side of the rail, we uh, I'm just telling you, I get tired of them. Um, they are exhausting a lot of the um, executive sessions that we have. So I do have some concerns about. Um, you know, potential lawsuits and reading, um, you know, state law and and stuff like that, that um, even with the two year sunset, that, that that will more than likely be challenged. So I'm not too amenable to um, for a three month wait and take a look at it. But at the same time, like, we have looked at this for so long. We really have. And um, I, when I first came on, one of the biggest issues that I faced, the first issue, you know, the late Jerry D. Smith helped me with, um, was an SDR. Um, and I'm seeing them cropping more and more up on my side of town. And, um, you know, I get, you know, people want to make investment, make money. But at the same time, my job is to protect our neighborhoods and protect, you know, the people who, who want to live in Athens. And Washington Post, um, you can look it up. They've done extensive research. They said STRs drive up prices of houses. If you spend an extra hundred and twelve thousand dollars, like what happened in one of my neighborhoods, it's going to make the value of all the other homes next to it go up as well because investors and other people are going to to see that. Oh well, and that's one of the reasons why so many people are turning their homes into STRs. That's good. Make money. I'm all for people making money, but at the same time what are we doing as a local government to preserve our neighborhood?
preserve the, you know, like I cannot imagine Cedar Creek, 60% of those homes turn into SDRs. It's a beautiful neighborhood. But just think about the vibrancy, how our schools will be affected, how um, streets will be managed. But I'm not against um, a three month wait to, you know, for, um, you know, for our attorneys to take a look for the planning commission to take a look at because I am concerned about the lawsuit but seriously folks, we do really have to understand that like you know the data is there we hear from our constituents I hear it all the time um, but we have to do something to protect our neighborhoods Commissioner Hamm sure I just got one more comment mayor and, and I, I guess the focus has been on on some of the, the three three month thing but I think y'all recognize and, and I hope you do that you know the three months ends up being ends up being six months ends up being a, a year because the process has to go through government ops it sounds like and then and then through back to this board to approve whatever government ops says back to the planning commission and back to us so y'all see right there it's already it's already dragged out beyond May as far as the calendar goes. As uh, I understand it, in this case, we would go directly to the Planning Commission and come directly back. Yes. Yeah. Oh, in this case, so I thought. I thought. Yeah, that's my, Yeah, that was my if, motion. If, if the you. if the other motion passed, we would assign to government. I would assign to government operations evaluation of this on a twelve year. Okay. 12 so with resident. the main motion, though, it's not going to. It's not. It's going straight to Planning Commission. Yes. Correct. And then, so that's even. That's an even. <laughs> that's an even longer process because then it comes back to us. And then uh, I thought I heard you say you're going to sign it, which that one passes okay. back to government ops as well. Is that not what I'm understanding to be? No, no, that, that, that would be the final. Okay, one. well, then I'll go back to my main, my main <laughs> point. I mean, if it's going back to Planning Commission, what, how do we know? I mean, they could send us the same thing back, y'all. He said that. I'm sorry. Do you see what I'm saying? I mean, and, and, or they can send something else back. That's a one-year sunset <coughs> thing. So... All I'm saying is, you know, let's 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 base our decision on how we how it impacts our neighborhoods, how it impacts our communities, and not not worry uh, about about uh, about a potential lawsuit. And because when we start doing that, we we do rush decision making, and we don't do good decision making. And also, you know, if the mayor if the substitute motion passes, then we have a chance to send it back to to the government ops where we can have a, a, a and Commissioner Fisher's on there, Commissioner Davenport chairs it, um, and and Commissioner Link is on there. We can have and a really on there? and and I'm on there, so we can have a really good discussion <coughs> about about how STRs can fit in the neighborhoods. And, you know, we look. Right. We look. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Taylor's on there too. Goodness, uh, but uh, but you know, in the original one, we also talked about the Atlanta model. So there are communities in in Georgia that are looking at putting regulations on STRs. They're not as strong as what we see in other other states, but but here in Georgia, they are doing some things uh, to, to to help to help with it. So. I, th I think um, I think I think the substitute motion is a good motion to make. I think it gets us doing something, and I think it gets gets staff uh, knowing where they need to go because right now they don't know where they're going. We've got uh, Commissioner Taylor, Thornton, Lincoln, Hull. <clears throat> to to speak to the um, sunset clause, we've we've been told, and I know you know we want to do the right thing by our constituents, but we also need to follow our legal advice of our attorney. And we know that the sunset clause is probably not going to stick. So let's not kind of get caught up on the, the um, sunset clause itself and really the, the language um, in which we can regulate, in which we can enforce. Because I'm sure if, if I've been told that, maybe nine or seven of y'all have been told the same thing. So that's Mr. it. Mr. Thornton. Um, I, first of all, I, I don't... Um, I don't, I'm not fearful of a lawsuit. Anybody can sue anybody for anything. It, it, it doesn't even matter. You can sue and, and be sued. Um, but I do want to make sure that Commissioner Hamby um, and I are on the same page. Um, the, I thought that the mayor was saying that if it was sent back anywhere, he was going to give direction. Not that it was going to go back and linger and, and come back with something else worse or, or the same thing. There was going to be direction given specifically. So it's not like it's going to go somewhere and sit on, you know, for discussion. 
am, am I right? Um, yes, Commissioner. Um, and, and that's the difference of what, we're, what we are debating and discussing today. I don't think directions were clear. Um, the, um, the, um, surely the recommendations from the attorney, even though we're not afraid of lawsuits, was not taken and data is not, um, was not available, which was stated in the minutes. If we keep doing the same thing the same way we keep doing things, we're going to be right back here with another mess. I just think that, and this isn't a mess, but a situation. But I do think this gives us an opportunity. You have three new commissioners on GOC. You're asking them to support something which they, they're intelligent, that they can read, that they really weren't part of those discussions. But uh, I wanted to make sure that if it went back to the planning committee, it, the difference this time would be that it would have some direction uh, from the mayor. Commissioner Link? Yeah, I'm, I, I just want to speak up for sending this back to GovOps, you know, before the planning commission, because, you know, we're the ones hearing from the people who are being impacted by this. Um, we're the ones getting the calls in the middle of the night when the STR down the street is making drug deals, because that's happening around the corner for me. Um, and we're the ones, you know, getting the calls from constituents who legitimately have investment properties that might be family properties that they want their grandparents or their kids to be able to visit for long term and, you know, rent it out as an STR to help pay the bills. Um, you know, there's a lot of nuance to this. Uh, and, and I think it, it deserves a more nuanced debate in something like Government Operations Committee because the planning commissioners aren't getting calls from constituents. That's not part of what they do. It's, it's us getting the calls and, and I think that we can do a better job of weighing those circumstances and tweaking that particular part of the ordinance um, to make it work. Um, to, to assure that we're not getting party houses in the middle of neighborhoods. Maybe there is room for party houses out in the country somewhere if you want to rent it for a wedding or something like that. But, you know, understand that, that our neighborhoods are nuanced places and the definition of a single family neighborhood does not conform to this kind of use and it never has. Mayor, am I out of order to call for um, the vote or the yeah, question? We, we've got just uh, one one more input, and then I'd like to uh, well, move to a vote. Just on respect, the Mr. Mayor, respectfully, I heard Commissioner Link. I respect your comment, but just she's not speaking for the whole body, you know, when she makes that comment. No, no, that's very clear. Yeah, Commissioner Hull. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, Commissioner Thorne is reading my mind. I, I was just writing on here, motion to call the question at the end. But, uh, but I, I, you know, I just I want to clarify because it sounds like there is some confusion of the issue. So, from Manager Williams, Mr. Lawney, and, and, and Attorney Drake, if we send this, if we deny this, send it to the Planning Commission with the specific focus that the mayor's agreed to sending it for. Do you think that we can get it back in front of us by May? Is that a reasonable timeline? With with the core text the same, yeah. just the request. Just in for terms of time, I'm not asking you to speak to what happens. Sunset. Just timeline. <clears throat> May is the earliest. Okay. I mean, that's that's the earliest we could have it back to you. Um, the planning commission has their own processes that they will go through. They have decisions that they have available to them. Holding them, holding a decision, I think, is possible for further development of the record. Um, so that is a scenario where it might not make it back in May, but it could beyond the April May cycle and make it back to this body. Okay, so they assuming they don't hold it, whatever they do would bring it back Correct. to us in May. Okay. And is that also does your office have time to do what they need to do between now and then, Attorney Drake? <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, you know, I, I if, if we get the version that staff brought to the Planning Commission, I'd be voting yes tonight. Um, and actually, I'm very appreciative of some of the revisions that the Planning Commission made, because I think it made it stronger, and even the conversation around the Sunset Clause I think is an important one to have. Um, but I do think it's important that whatever we enact at the outset has the strongest version possible at the outset, and so I'm hoping we'll get that. So I'll, I'll move to call the question. All right, so uh, we're going to move. Uh, we'll motion to call the question all in favor. Aye. Uh, uh, we're gonna no no no. no. Okay, all right. Uh, we're gonna move to uh, substitute motion. 
Commissioner Myers is the primary motion. Mayor, call. I'm not sure that the motion to call the question passed, actually. Does it? Sorry. No, no show of hands, yeah. ma'am. Roll call. Uh, roll, call. Uh, roll call on calling the question uh, <laughs> made by Commissioner Houle. Yeah. Houle? Yes. Culpepper? Yes. Myers? No. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? No. Davenport? No. Link? No. Taylor? No. Fisher? Yes. Four yes, five no. All right. Uh, uh, further substantive input from Commissioner Myers? This, this is going to be very substantive. Uh, clarification on this substitute, well, on Dexter, <laughs> Commissioner Fisher's motion. The original motion. Can you clarify if, with the direction that we've been talking about, that the mayor <coughs> will be given, would the possibility that it could just come back with a sunset clause completely taken out of that? Is that correct? I mean, we're not giving, we're not saying, you're not, we're not making, you're not giving them direction to say, put a sunset clause in there. And if they, and everything we've heard, one of their options might be, because it seems to be, you know, one I hear among colleagues here, that we just have no sunset and go back to the original one without a sunset of five or 10 or whatever. So that could be a possibility. I just wanted to clarify that. <coughs> yeah, and, and actually, this is a helpful opportunity for staff. I've been taking notes listening to the deliberation. We have, reconsideration of the sunset provision, remove it, change it, mm -hmm. uh, data, reporting back on data mm -hmm. on the issue. Case law analysis was another point that was raised to make sure that, that we've covered all of our bases. And a relief valve provision of some sort, which I think would have to be looked into and understood as I'm sitting here tonight, I'm not really sure what that would be. So those were the four things I have um, for staff to work to develop to bring to the Planning Commission for consideration. <coughs> to answer your question about the Planning Commission's actions, I think what we've seen is they can take things into account and then make their own motion right. to recommend the wording that they see as appropriate. That, that's what I thought. So mm -hmm. it could be that they say a one-year sunset or they could say a 20-year sunset or they could take a sunset part out that they added in because it wasn't there in the original. So all of those are options. I just want to clarify that those are all options. Mm -hmm. That was very substantive. <laughs> very substantive. All right. Okay. Any further input? Here. Oh, Link. Yeah. That's, uh, last input. Uh, well, in the meantime, we've had more Airbnbs come online despite our moratorium. One popped up around the corner from me. And we've had no compliance officer to keep an eye on these things, and we've had no official legislation to say that they're illegal. So what's to stop more and more of these from coming up as we await this process? Item number 28. Uh, yeah, but I mean, that's, it's gonna take months to even hire that person, but by passing this ordinance tonight as is, it clearly states that the law is <coughs> No more of these in single family neighborhoods. And, you know, lawsuits can take months and years to pan out. But, you know, by passing this tonight, it certainly puts a clear legal statement that they are not legal in single family neighborhoods. Does that compliance officer, are they able to go back in Airbnb's records and find ones that came online since the moratorium so we can pull them offline? So Does the, would the law allow that to be that rug to be yanked out from under? Uh, assistant manager uh, Edwards is here. Can answer that? Yes. The uh, the software will allow us to do a look back. So the idea is do a look back 12 months from the beginning of the moratorium. 12 months from the beginning of the moratorium. 12 months prior to the moratorium starting is probably a better way for me to say that. Okay. So <coughs> that would help gather data. But. It, it, it could take us months to get this person up and running, correct? Mr. Fisher? Yeah, I just want to, I want to ask our attorney one question. If this passes and if a um, lawsuit is filed, what happens? Does, does everything is put on hold? What, what happens right. if, we, if this passes tonight among our colleagues and there's a lawsuit filed, or even a class action lawsuit is filed? What happens? Does everything stop? Can we continue to move forward, or does everything stop? What happens? Well, 
similar I mean, I can only hypothecate what someone might do, but similar to what happened with the uh, bar ordinance when we roll back the hours of the closing hours of the bars, it wouldn't be surprised if someone sought an temp a temporary restraining order, an injunction to prohibit enforcement of it, you know, and we would argue against that right. very vigorously. Right. But I mean, I, that, you know, you, you get litigation, I can't, but I would imagine they would try and stay enforcement until a ruling is made is what a Attorney would probably do on the other side, similar to exactly what happened with the uh, bar hour bar hours, hours, which we ultimately okay. reached a compromise. Okay. But uh, that might be a potential first move that an opposing attorney might make. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, okay. I have mine. Three. All uh, right. You've you've expired. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Culpepper. You're, you're expired. <laughs> So based on what Attorney Drake said, <laughs> there could be a restraining order, and then we could, this could last for t longer than sending it back to anything. So why not get it right so we can get it enforced within, before football season comes around versus, ha where, like I said earlier, where we can control the timeline. If it gets hung up on, in court, we can't control the timeline. So let's get it right. Commissioner uh, Hamby? Yeah, yeah, that's my, I'm expired after this one, I believe. And this is a, a question for Commissioner, uh, uh, Manager, uh, Attorney Drake. Um, so, I mean, certainly, certainly the worst case scenarios have been heard here tonight, but also there's another case scenario where certainly if it does go to court, they could sever, there's, uh, what's yeah, the word? The, we we the, argue vigorously and we. Well, what's that word, severability or. or oh, we'll where, the where, severability provision, you know, we, we would, for example, if the, if someone, a litigant, sought to strike down the two-year uh, sunset provision, we would argue that uh, there are several severability provisions embedded in the ordinance. There's three of them, and that we would ask the court to set that provision aside only. That's part of the, that's the argument we would make, uh, and allow the rest of the ordinance to continue. Right. That's what our argument would be. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate you saying that because I think that also presents uh, presents an option beyond what what uh, was just discussed but also going back to uh, what it, you know passing this and, and and commenting on uh, what some of the well, commissioners have said getting something going and then sending it back to the government ops for further discussion and further refinement is the way to go because you, you talked about being in a hurry this planning commission is going to be in a hurry to get something done and they may not they may not agree with whatever recommendation comes 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 or whatever direction comes down. So we'll yep. be back at the same spot again. And meanwhile, as Commissioner Link said, more and more Airbnbs are coming on board uh, that are impacting impacting neighborhoods. I, yeah, bet, I bet after I mean, I bet more are going to be coming online anytime yeah, soon. I would like to say, in two, it's we're our the attorney's office is going to vigorously uh, advocate for whatever this commission decides and. Uh, there's been talk around guidance we've given in memos. I mentioned the memo that we sent. It's our job sometimes to advise you of all the possible consequences, and that's what we try to do. But I want to make clear, you know, we're not a, we're we're going to do whatever this body wants to do as vigorously and, and, and fully as we as we can. You know, is what I, I want to make clear. And uh, <clears throat> you made a good point. Just because we offer a possibility, we don't know what the court may do. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so. Uh, uh, I uh, just want to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. attorney. <coughs> All right. Everybody ready? Mm -hmm. I, I do think, Mr. Mayor, before you start, is this? Oh, I appreciate this. It may this. become an issue, and it's been talked about today. So we have a commissioner who's recused, and I say talked about it. I had Commissioner Fisher call me about this, so I was sat down and talked to the clerk and I talked to the mayor and looked at it, this issue about. So we have a commissioner who's accused herself, so we have nine people here, and uh, – it's clear on our charter that to pass an ordinance, which this is, it's a text amendment to zoning ordinance, it takes six votes, okay? Uh, the question is gonna come up though, if it don't pass with six votes, then we're gonna have a vote, we're gonna, have a, we're gonna vote on the main motion, which is to deny and to send it back, recommend it go back to the Planning Commission. It's not clear under our ordinance that we gotta have six, uh, that we gotta have six votes to deny. It's just six under the charter to approve. So I want everybody to understand, and I talked to Jean, and she says it's consistent how we've done it in the past. Five votes can deny. 
So I don't want you this, I don't, you know, so if we want to have a discussion about that now before this gets all heated and everyone's, I want to have that now, and get that on table. Can we take a break? Hey, is everybody, take a break? We're, we're, we're going to vote on this. Everybody can about this Let's vote. No, I, I have a question for the oh, attorney. Oh, I mean, certainly, certainly, you know, if, if, if I, I would, if it doesn't state it in the charter, you shouldn't apply it in the charter. So, I well, mean, that's how we've done it and, consistently with well, everything. Just because we've done it consistently, as we've learned, we're not, we haven't always done things right consistently. Oh, Lord. So, oh, Lord. So, so, Get all of us fired. <laughs> no, no, I'm just I, saying, I, mean, it's, it's I, need, gonna... I need clarity from the attorneys. So. Well, I, you know, uh, <laughs> another example where we've done that is that it doesn't say for even a resolution or one of your agenda items, we allow those to pass without six. We do that because it only says you got to have six for an ordinance, you know. So, I mean, I can only go, I'm telling you, the clerk confirmed it. I think it's that's how I interpret it. Uh, I understand if you might have a different opinion, but. She indicates that's consistent with how we've done it, you know, and uh, uh, the charter doesn't, you're right. So I'm just making that, I'm, before this if it becomes a big issue, I'm putting it out there now. Okay. That's my understanding of the, of the rules. Commissioner Hull and Dan. As Ford a practical Adam. matter, well, that's, that's my. I appreciate this being clarified ahead of time. I mean, it is the charter notes that you need six affirmative votes to enact an ordinance. Denial of something is not enacting something. So five is sufficient if it's over four. So I'll move to call the question. I'll motion, second. Motion to call the question. Second from Commissioner Myers. Uh, we'll do a uh, round about calling the question. Who? Yes. Culpepper? Yes. Myers? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Link? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Fisher? Yes. Nine? Uh, yes. All right. Thank you, Madam uh, Clerk. We are going to return to the substitute motion from Commissioner Myers for the first vote. Ready? Just, just She's going to call you. Okay. Myers? Yes. Thornton? No. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Link? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Fisher? No. Hull? No. Culpepper? No. Five yes, four no. All right. Uh, given that an ordinance requires six votes, we're going to return to the original motion. Uh, presented from Commissioner Fisher. Fisher? Yes. Hull? Yes. Hellpepper? Yes. Myers? No. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? No. Davenport? No. Link? No. Taylor? No. Four yes, five no. Twenty and All right, so. <laughs> Oh Lord! So, so we don't have direction, and so what we're going to have to contemplate is a direction, a move. A All right. Um, th this is uh, past the point when we, by standard, would have taken a break. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a 15-minute recess.
Uh, he's here for the budget. Welcome back, everyone. Good to have you here. Hope everybody's enjoying living in interesting times. Um, having consummated no action on item 25, uh, given that it requires six votes to pass an ordinance and at least a majority to deny an action, and we didn't receive either of those outcomes, I'm going to ask a member of the body to make a fresh motion at this point. Commissioner Myers. I'd like to make a motion to approve. Uh, so motion is to approve the Planning Commission recommendation as presented. Second. All right. I've got a motion from Commissioner Myers, and I have a second from Commissioner Hamby. Commissioner Myers, would you like to speak to the motion? Yeah, the only thing I'd like to say is that uh, previously I requested that you send it to a committee, a, a commission committee, in a year's time. I'd like you to send it immediately to the one of the committees, I think the GOC that had it before, so that it can go in for further discussion um, sooner rather than later. Uh, th thank you for the request, uh, Commissioner. Given my committee assignment power as mayor of the Unified Government of athens Clark County, I will assign to government operations the question of any modification immediately and request that that come back to the full body within two months. Uh, I'll note that simultaneously, I'm going to assign to the Planning Commission an opportunity to work with the county attorney uh, to modify the code text that currently requires a simple up or down vote by the county commission on a planning commission text amendment uh, such that in the future the county commission could modify a text amendment recommendation that may come from the planning commission in much the same way that we can modify a zoning or a special use recommendation from the planning commission so those are, are two assignments uh, that i would be making tonight under any circumstances so I've got a motion from Commissioner Myers. Would you like to speak to the motion? Commissioner Hamby is seconder. No, I'm good. Thank you, Mayor. Would anyone else like to ask a question of the process or speak to the motion? All right. Uh, Madam Clerk, if you could do a roll call for us, please. Myers? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Blink? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Fisher? Yes. Poole? Yes. Culpepper? Yes. Nine yes, zero no. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. <laughs> Thanks for coming to this evening's presentation of Parliamentary Procedure. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we're going to move on to item 26. Uh, uh, 26 is consideration of an ordinance to impose, continue, or extend a temporary moratorium on the establishment of new short-term rentals on parcels in single-family residential zoning districts. And uh, given that this is published and on the agenda, uh, we, we are going to continue uh, given that we have already made public notice of this. Uh, so as is the case with planning and zoning items, uh, any member of the public has an opportunity to provide input on this for up to three minutes as previously discussed. Would any member of the public like to speak to item 26? I can speak. 
speak to you, you can speak to this the separate item I, I just want to be sure I understand properly so now that you have passed this measure into an ordinance uh, the temporary moratorium is no longer needed uh, but because the ordinance actually bans the um, the establishment of new STRs Right. Uh, so as soon as I, I would sign one? the ordinance, Ms. Vickers, yeah. we no longer would need the moratorium. Right. But because, because the moratorium was advertised to the public, we have this opportunity exactly. for public input. Yeah. Now, I just want to be sure that it means we don't have any more SDRs established. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Except under the new contours of the ordinance. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, Attorney Drake, uh, if you could read this, please. In order, to, in order to impose, continue, and extend the temporary moratorium on the establishment of new short-term rentals on parcels in single-family residential zoning districts and for other purposes. Thank you, Attorney Drake. And, and, and Attorney Drake, g given our prior action, what would your recommendation be to the body? I, I, would, I would recommend that y'all uh, deny this ordinance based upon your prior action. I uh, appreciate that, Attorney Drake. Is there a motion to deny? Motion to deny, citing the previous action. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Houle to deny, second from Commissioner Myers. Any further comment, Commissioner Houle? I think we've talked about this plan. Commissioner Myers? No. Any Maybe further input from the body? So motion is to deny extension of the moratorium, given that it's no longer necessary, uh, because I've just signed the ordinance that the commission just passed. So. Or a motion to not approve the moratorium extension. Yeah, same yeah. thing. It, and I just want to be clear with the signing of that document and then this next motion, if mm -hmm. it is the end of the moratorium, we will be processing requests start of business tomorrow yep. with the home Based on the new ordinance. Correct. Yep. Correct. Okay. That helps. I mean, if you want to keep it in place, I don't think this body wants to do that. You know, I mean, you, you asked me unequivocally what I recommend. <laughs> do you want some time? I mean, to, to put this in place, Mr. Mayor? I mean, or is there is this? I, I, I believe, I mean, I, I will give great credit to staff and great credit to your office, Attorney Drake, in having crafted what I think is a strong core ordinance that contemplates really what I would hope to be a model right. for the rest of the state in short term rental regulation. And I'm certainly ready to see it take wings and fly. Right. Um, I, covered? I, I think, yeah, I'm covered. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, all in favor of no extension of the moratorium, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, motion carries. All right. We're going to move on to item 27. Uh, item 27 is adoption of the official zoning map to include all amendments since 2018. This is a procedural matter just as we update what is in the book to reflect the things that have actually happened in this room tonight. So, so moved. So moved. I, uh, well, I, I do need to take public input because it is a planning and zoning item. So is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this item? You have the same opportunity as you had in prior, prior items. All right, seeing none, would a member of this body like to make a motion? Um, so moved. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Wright. Oh, Is second. there a second? Second. All right, I've got a second from Commissioner Thorne. It's a motion to approve. A uh, motion to approve. Uh, Commissioner Wright, would you like to speak to this? I, I would like to talk, but I don't need to. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Thorne. I have nothing to say, sir. All right. Um, uh, Attorney Drake, do you need to read this ordinance? This is the adoption of the official zoning map to include all amendments. Yes, sir. In order to amend the Code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to adoption of an official zoning <coughs> map and for other purposes. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Hearing none, motion carries. All right. Um, we are going to move on to old and new business. So now is the time when we receive uh, public input on old and new business. So tonight, those are items 3 and 26 to 35. Three, or excuse me, and 28 to 35. Three and 28 to 35. Any member of the public like to speak to any of these items? Good uh, evening. Yes, um, I would like to briefly speak on item 32 for the pay study. I think it's a very good idea to do the pay study, especially the um, to increase it to the MIT living wage calculator uh, from $15 to I think it's 16, 17 cents. 
Um, I think it's a, um, in terms of putting this as a good for employees of the of ACC government, this in turn will help to alleviate some of the into sorry to increase some of the wages of non um, ACC employees in terms of just competition for um, higher paying jobs. Um, the effect of having more higher paying jobs in the government will allow more higher paying jobs in the private sector to do that competition as well. <clears throat> Athens Court County has a low unemployment rate, um, relatively speaking, but it still suffers from very large poverty and the increasing of wages is a very, is, um, an eff is needed to address this issue and the pay study to, um, in effect, uh, to increase payment to ACC government workers would do a great deal of help to alleviate this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and just a note for the record, Madam Clerk, it was Dylan Woolsey who also spoke to an earlier item. So, would anyone else like to speak to old or new business? Again, that is item three and 28 through 35. Good evening. Hey, good evening. Um, Broderick Flanagan, P.O. Box 295. I'm here to speak as a, a resident and not in my official capacity uh, with Economic Justice Coalition. But, uh, I did want to speak to 28 and a couple of other items. Um, back in uh, 2020, 2021, uh, when Prosperity Capital Partners came to buy up a bunch of those um, uh, rental uh, properties and units, um, there was a lot of displacement and there were a lot of like apartments that were found in inhabitable, con inhabitable conditions. And so uh, I did reach out to code enforcement and talk to some staff about what was going on uh, with uh, th those situations. And, uh, you know, it was so, so at that point in time, uh, it was, you know, understaffed, which is understandable. Um, so I'm glad you all are, you know, hiring a full time code enforcement person. Um, there needs to be uh, just more oversight in that department and enforcement, and then uh, some kind of education uh, programming or, or uh, you know, services for the community and how to utilize that. Because um, a lot of people did not know what to do, what information to gather, to take to code enforcement and, and those things um, related to like housing and habit habitability. And then there were other things that I think uh, need to be addressed as well uh, related to um, some things I think code enforcement could potentially do. Uh, related to uh, helping to keep uh, or helping to incentivize uh, landlords to upkeep their property. I was able to go to um, a conference about economic development in Chicago and some other states are, were talking about doing some, some pretty th uh, cool things, I think, related to like uh, giving grades out to that the government managed, like giving grades out to certain properties for keeping certain um, standards uh, within their uh, property, rental properties. Um, a lot of these things were related to affordable housing um, and as well as like the pay study. Um, I do support like continuing with the pay study to make sure all athens Clark County employees um, have decent wages because that's connected to affordable housing and housing. Um, and I also remember back in 2016 when I came to speak about the infill housing study, uh, at least four or five of you were on the commission uh, when I was talking about uh, policies like infill housing need to be more expansive than, than to just cover single family neighborhoods um, because you're offering protections in the single family zone neighborhoods, but many African American and other communities are zoned multifamily and so they don't, so they don't have those same protections. And so all of these things are intertwined um, and uh, I, I could share more, but I know I'm almost out of time at this point. Uh, but uh, I think we need to revisit some of those things to make sure like uh, Commissioner Taylor was speaking to. Um, protections for certain communities that are under threat of displacement. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flanagan. Is anyone here to speak to older new business? Older new business. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, begin commission discussion uh, with item number three. And Commissioner Taylor, you asked for discussion of this. I'll turn it to you. Yes. So I have been speaking with constituents, and I've also said it. Um, I lost my train of thought. The East Downtown TAD meeting. Well, you know, the district that I represent, and I don't have to keep saying it because if you ride through the East Side, then you see that we have been under allocated and underfunded, and we need resources. So, you know, um, the 30% that was um, originally brought forth, um, 
the last time we met, I said that I would be reaching out to some um, of my residents. So together, um, we are forming our own task force in Inner East Athens with community leaders, the business leaders, and key economic development organizations. And we're also um, enlisting advisors from the National League of Cities and the National Associations of, of Counties. Um, just for assistance and guidance, because what I have heard, and this is my first um, year, um, and also my first time dealing with TADS. And so for my understanding, um, <coughs> I have um, reached out to them. Um, and so we are not taking 30%. Um, yeah, that's, um, we want to we wanna sit down and we want to come up with a more equitable percentage for our area because 30%, when all of those things come up that the arena is proposing, like an Airbnb building, my community is going to be um, prime for short-term rentals because I, I highly doubt if regular families could, you know, just come into Athens and afford that Airbnb, that Airbnb building that the arena is proposing. So um, just for my sake and the sake of my community, um, yeah, we, we're not, so, um, I will be getting with Gene Spratlin about, um, I don't know, Judd said we could just change the um, percentages, but I think I want to give you some gray hair. You called me about it, and I said, well, I don't think you need a CDO, because it's just, I looked at the agenda, and it just says, Mayor and Commission adopt a resolution to amend the East Downtown Tax Allocation District to include, it currently says, a 30% mandatory distribution of yearly tax increment, increment to, the, to the East Athens neighborhood, so I thought it could just be changed the percentage I actually drafted during the break a CDO to do that but uh, change it if you wanted to but uh, you know uh, that's that I, I apologize if I didn't give you good advice I thought oh, no, this was pretty fine. straightforward you know and I still think the body wants to do that uh, they it can you know or unless I'm not aware of a, I know I'm not aware of a rule that says every CDO has to be in writing it's something complicated I think it should be but I'm willing to follow that rule if that's the rule I thought this was pretty straightforward and, and, and it needs to be said too this is not to set it ultimately this is the agenda actually actually says it's to give direction to staff so we can prepare <coughs> an amendment to the uh, uh, redevelopment, redevelopment plan to bring back for final <coughs> approval so even though you get this tonight it might not be locked in is what I'm trying to tell you but it gives direction to staff you know and it gives y'all an opportunity for discussions what the purpose of the resolution was that's what you wanted right mayor well and and given <coughs> um, kind of what you described Commissioner Taylor as desiring some greater community input and engagement I'd certainly be glad to engage with <coughs> folks in the community there um, you know, tads were sort of a construct that I looked to see this government use obviously we've we've once used them successfully uh, with the mall area redevelopment um, it, it was a complex and lengthy process um, and that was a particularly large project um, it in some ways exemplifies the way that the majority of TADs uh, across the country work, which is that the footprint of redevelopment is also the footprint of where you see that investment. Um, the prospective 30%, you know, was a pretty significant deviation from that in that you would be leveraging new creation of value for East Athens. Um, of course, it's always worth noting that the nature of a tax allocation district is that the dollars have to be spent within the boundaries mm -hmm. of it. So in this case, what's east of the river available for expenditure are the housing authority properties, the two public parks that athens Clark County owns, and then the public rights of way. So basically the streets and the sidewalks. Yeah, well, <laughs> we, and that's why I enlisted outside help because I really don't feel like I would get the entire truth because what I am trying to say is, is that the arena, although it has public, um, I mean, private investors, it also has been paid with taxpayer dollars, which are also east side dollars, inner east side dollars. And what I don't want to see is that monstrosity go up and my community still looks the same that it did when I was a little girl. So whatever procedures that we have to do to include us, that we get the same amount of treatment as the rest of the nine districts, then that's, that's fine with me. But we will not be 
ousted. We will not be coddled or patronized when it comes to the percentages. You know, I sit in the meetings and no one kind of notices the little black girl in the back. But they, you know, say things like the East Side doesn't have any money. I've also heard that the East Side isn't educated enough or comprehends enough to even be a part of a tag. And that's that's the thing, because when you when you think about the East Side, you automatically think of crime. You automatically think of single moms. You ought to think automatically we're predominantly black. Not so much because we've been so gentrified that we're not it's not even all black anymore. And so when I when I speak about this, it's, it's because it's not only important to me, but it's also important to the people that's watching. They may not show up, but they're watching. And, and no. So whatever we have to do fairly and equitably. And, and I want to be very respectful when I say this. I speak with a lot of passion because I care about my community. So if you're going to come in after me, don't patronize me. Don't, don't, um, little girl, my, my comment, because I mean it. My, my constituents vote as well, and they pay their taxes too. So do I. So. Commissioner Davenport. So we can do a motion to deny, correct? Because if we motion to deny, it sends it back to, well, it sends it, like all other time, to a user group. And, um, and what the user group, if, if I'm correct, the user group decides how those tad dollars are used. So. Am I, I'm getting that look, but I, I think that's how we set these tags up. Like well, we, we created uh -huh. a user group, and so um, if we deny this, wouldn't that go back to the user group so they can decide well, that's, how those? That's are. true. The user groups have to make a recommendation, but this is more specific than that. This first came up. Uh, Commissioner uh, Thornton requested me to seek guidance on this from Dan McRae, and what this would propose to do is to say that whatever a certain percentage of the money that is collected from this tad would go to the uh, what we refer to as the uh, uh, East Athens neighborhood, which is basically everything on the east side of the river. And so uh, there was some discussion between them. So com I think what Commissioner Taylor is saying is she doesn't think 30% is enough. That's what it currently says. So it's different. It, it, th then the committee would have to work within those bounds. Does that make sense? If we said 50%, they'd have half the dollars that have to go over there. Right now, that's not the case. It kind of puts a further restriction on it. Does that but if you deny it, right? does it not go yeah, back? Yeah, if it deny it, you're just back to square one. Right. And yeah. we're tired of being at square one. So I think sorry, Jim, Manager I'm Williams just had some process input <coughs> in his supervision of economic so, development. When you say user group, we, we talk about the TAD advisory committee. Yeah. And uh, and and at least the way that in practice, um, they don't necessarily recommend or decide the uh, the geography of it or the allocation of funds. You know, in the redevelopment plan, their role is to recommend projects within the TAD. So I think some of the logistics of the TAD, I would argue, are reserved for the commission. Uh, as opposed to the, to the committee and I did not this did not come neither one of these came from the committee and I wouldn't recommend them going back to the committee I think this is a mayor and commission decision to direct staff the manager to have staff amend the redevelopment plans to reflect these changes but did, did, hopefully I articulated that correct so if we not get my colleagues uh, concerned but denial will send it back to the um, committee it didn't denial would just allow the the uh, committee to continue the work as they have been doing um, and so what, what they've done and and I'm going to encapsulate this and manager Williams may want to uh, make a couple of other notes but one is that if there is an application for a building project within the tax allocation district and there is going to be use of some of those future funds then they have to consider whether that is appropriate use of those future funds and make a recommendation to this body. So that's thing one. Thing two is kind of a more general community outreach effort that they've had underway in each of the groups in recent months in which they've asked the community more broadly, what would you like to see in this zone? Uh, Manager Williams, I don't know if that accurately captures it or if you'd like to add a little bit more. Yes, yes, if I could. So uh, in the redevelopment plan, it was uh, contemplated that the committee would understand obviously the characteristics of the district and the needs of the district maybe go on some fact finding to find out what the needs of the district are through this community engagement and then identify some areas where investments could be made um, and, and entertain uh, rec uh, uh, 
applications, if you will, from developers in that district to make a recommendation on to the mayor and commission. So it's really about the nuts and bolts of, of how things play out there, but the construct, I would say, is more mayor and commission. Commissioner Wright. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I was looking, I guess, for a little more clarity on what we would, uh, would satisfy Commissioner Taylor. Are you wanting more time on this topic with the group you were listing um, a good many community members that you're working with um, in the National League of Cities. What was the county one? A National County Association? Or NACO. NACO. And so do you, like it's March 5th? Uh, uh, I think March 5th is enough time. So, to yeah. to what, because then, because then that would give if that's giving you enough time to 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 get. So if you need more time or or not, um, then we'll have a motion after discussion. Or is there a motion on the floor? Uh, there's there's no motion on the floor at this point. Discussion. Yeah. Discussion. Yeah. Okay. Because again, th this was one of the slate of items removed for further work. Uh, which is kind of the direction that it, it sounds like we're heading in. But Commissioner Thornton, I want to turn to you. Um, I, yeah, I guess I wanted to make sure I understood to, um, I know what I thought it meant. I, first of all, is this the only TAD that we have that covers two districts? Uh, There's several that have multiple commission districts. That's okay, them. okay. Um, so when I, when I, um, um, inquired with Judd earlier, um, last year to be exact, um, my, my thought was whatever dollars come into a TAD, how do you, how do you distribute them? How do you distribute them? And, um, and my exact question was, because normally you would think 50-50, and, and you would know that east side would uh, inner east side would get 50 and downtown would get 50 but that's not the case it could be whatever you say it could be 80 20 it could be 90 10 and whatever those dollars are that we agree on as the commission that's what the user groups make their recommend that you say this is how much money or this is where you could spend that was my interpretation and I am agreeing with Commissioner Taylor I think that we've invested a lot downtown and we'll do a lot more investing and this gives us um, that side of town that has been neglected for so long uh, extra foot up so when we talk about equity and equality this is equitable this is catching people up. This is not an equal balance, like 50-50 or whatever. So that's what she, I think, Commissioner Taylor, I'm on the right track there because I see your head down. Um, and and, and, I, and what, else, what else I think, she has sought other information or other resources because this is new to her, which is new is new to all of us. And my question is, Mayor, after this discussion, is it, are you saying that we have to wait till March to make, um, wait for, because apparently she has the CDO in her hand. Can we vote, is that possible to vote on tonight if there is a motion to vote on it? We certainly could vote on a motion tonight. Uh, it, it sounds like there is not a um, collective direction and sort of a sense of range of expenditures. You know, that would be among the things that would be healthy to have just in proceeding kind of with some sense of well, well what sorts of things could we be talking about building of course we described the the nature of the geography of the district earlier and so really it is those locales those housing authority properties virginia walker park and uh, east athens park Aaron her park that, that would be the prospective recipients of the funds. well well now let's also remember to allison commissioner uh right you are now part of that tad aren't you some kind of way i'm the um West side of the downtown piece part of the tad. You're, she's a contributing sense. part of the tad also so um i think there's probably need whatever the recommendations come it should come from commissioner taylor and commissioner wright as um giving us some direction i don't feel comfortable speaking um or even voting on something that is not directly connected to me but i do think that that tad 
if that is, is what Commissioner Taylor is recommending, 70-30 with 70 going to Inner East, I could support that tonight <coughs> if we voted on it. Commissioner Myers. Yeah, I'm, I'm just pulled up the TAD maps, and I, and I think what, um, you know, Commissioner Taylor is rightly bringing up is very particular to this TAD. Um, I was just going by that arena development and the kind of the kind of money that's in the arena, forget about all the stuff that's coming around it, and then contrast with East Athens. I mean, you don't have another TAD where, in a sense, it's like two different worlds. And um, that is, I think, needed to have a discussion of that and to address some of the inequities or lots of them that you're bringing up there. But I, I do think this is an unusual situation among our TADs if you just look at them. So I'm just adding that in. And, and certainly I think that the way it was drawn was to create some opportunity to draw wealth into that part of, of town. Without a doubt, about uh, Commissioner Hamby and sure, Commissioner Fisher. I was, was going to say the same thing, Mayor. That you know, I remember the, when we were discussing these these six tabs that we have. The, in, the intent of this one, you know, was was to help across the river, and we knew that the development was going around uh, around the Classic Center, and we knew, you know, we had all these lessons on tabs and knew where, you know, if the dollars come from that development around the Classic Center, then it can go to. East Athens. That was the whole tent. That was the whole intent of, of drawing the map that we did to, to make sure some resources um, went went there. And also, you know, we've done what we, you know, we, I mean, we've, as, as Commissioner Myers mentioned, we have done a lot to help the Classic Center. And in this area, there's a special tax district where we raised uh, uh, the tax uh, millage rate uh, two mills, I believe. So, so certainly, you know, I think, I think looking at uh, looking at what what um, what East Athens needs are and and don't put some don't don't put limitations on us just yet is, is the way I would see it yeah I mean I I was one who advocated to include the residential East Athens in this TAD um, when we were developing the TADs um, specifically so all that intense downtown development revenue could be funneled into this community that has been overlooked for generations. Um, and I believe we've already encumbered, what is it, 15% of the TAD towards the Classic Center? What Wasn't that? So, so we haven't allocated any TAD dollars. Wasn't that part of the breakdown on the spreadsheet that there was like, a portion of the financing came from TAD dollars. Uh, in, in the various prospects, that was a prospect, but it's not been realized. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's not, there's no TAD no, no, dollars. No TAD dollars are allocated. Are, are financing the Classic Center at all? Not at this point, not at all. Okay. Uh, but there, but their TAD dollars in the TAD pot. Yeah. That's the value, the value of the property. Yeah, okay. The, and so it's the value of the private property, remember, that creates the lift in the TAD. Value of public properties, you know, whether that would be a new courthouse, if the courthouse should land in the TAD, th they don't contribute because those are, are public and non-taxable. Um, I'd love to see this TAD map with some properties highlighted to which those TAD dollars could be applied, those public properties, those housing authority properties, um, you know, because there is potential, you know, to to spend whatever portion we decide. Um, and also, you know, some projected, some revenue projections, um, so we can have an idea, uh, you know, and, and allow that TAD committee to envision how they'd be spent. Um, I mean, I, in my mind, it was always the vision that this TAD would, you know, a, a huge portion of it, you know, a, a big reason for it was to, to bring improvements to that neighborhood. Commissioner Fisher. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So I got a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, how was how was determination for us who got 70, who got 30 determined? How was that determined? Who, who made that decision that 70% would go to downtown and 30 would go to East Athens? Was that a commission? The, no, that, that, in some ways it was arbitrary. It was uh, it was me designating that at least thirty 
uh, would would be delivered to you know those properties we discussed earlier in okay. East Athens. Okay. And then my other question is, um, is there a possibility to expand other areas in East Athens, or are we locked in to what we got? Uh, I think when we were talking about West Broad recently, what we learned is that if we would like to essentially recast the TAD, we'd in some ways be starting from scratch. And so that's an option. We can basically reset the clock and we can say, you know, we're going to have this differently shaped zone. Um, you, you might remember at the mini retreat, we wanted to say, what is the process for an amended TAD or a new TAD altogether? Because right now we just don't have that construct. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and, and these all six course came in together, sort of as a package, um, five years, well, four years ago now. So, uh, Manager Williams, well, I was just going to add to Commissioner Link's uh, points. So there are some expenses that have yet to be paid uh, associated, and that has to do with some of the peripheral transportation improvements. And I think everybody will remember when they talked about building a big parking deck down there, uh, that we would need to be able to uh, create a system where a bunch of folks could all exit at one time. So there'd be intersection improvements, I think, at five around there, uh, as well as uh, participating. Right now, that parking deck will get built on an existing stormwater system, which is not great, but it serves the entire basin. And so there will be some shared cost in building some underground and there'll be shared maintenance going forward. So there are a couple of cost items that are not in the current budget. They're not been approved, but they're coming with the development of this parking deck. And so I say all that to say, I don't, there's no budgets right now being talked about specifically, but there are some things that need to get paid for one way or another. I'm not saying you can't move forward tonight, but this is something you need to be aware of. Thanks, Manager Williams. <coughs> Commissioner Taylor. I'm, I'm ready to vote on 7030 now. Which way? I would like to make a motion to adopt a resolution to amend the East Downtown Tax Allocation District to include 30% mandatory distribution of yearly tax increment to the East Athens neighborhood. 70, I'm sorry. <laughs> what I say, y'all? I know, I'm like, what? What I say? Girl, you know. I was on a roll. <laughs> 70, girl. 70. 70. <laughs> I've got a motion second. from Commissioner Taylor. Is there a second? I'll second. All right. Got a motion from what Commissioner Taylor. Boy. I've got a second from Commissioner Wright. Some candy. I need a drink. Commissioner Wright, any further? Bottle. I'm ready to vote. The bottle. The bottle. All right. Any further input from the body before we go to roll call? All right. Do a roll call beginning <laughs> with Commissioner Taylor. Taylor? Yes. Wright? Yes. Fisher? Yes. Poole? Yes. Culpepper? Yes. Myers? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Amby? Yes. Davenport? Yes. Link? Yes. Ten, yes, zero, no. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I appreciate it. All right. We are going to move to item 28, and this establishes the full-time code enforcement for position. Did I entertain a motion regarding this item? Move to approve. All right. Second. Got a motion from Commissioner Poole. Who is the seconder? Myers. Uh, second from Commissioner Myers. Commissioner Hool, any follow-up remarks? I don't know if there's going to be debate here, so I'll keep it super brief, <laughs> hoping there won't be. But, um, yeah, I think given everything that we've done, we need to move forward with this position um, to make meaningful use of the data that we're going to have. Thanks. Commissioner Myers. Yeah, I, I noticed that the job title was changed to Code Enforcement Administrator. And it, am I correct in seeing that change? Enforcement officer after some conversations with the attorney's office and HR, uh, that's the position that they recommended. Okay, to okay. be able to I'm enforce, to, enforce yeah, to, to do enforcement. We had it was right, a coordinator right. last time, so yeah, in order no, for this I, person to do enforcement, it needed to be a code okay. enforcement officer. I, I think in the job, and well, I copied it from the yes, that's fine. We'll fix it if it's okay. Um, I guess. If I may, should yeah, I? Would you feel more comfortable, Commissioner Myers, if I specified in my motion the job title? No, no I'm just I I uh, did a um, screenshot of it, and so it wasn't even my typing. It does so. it does say in our attachment, code enforcement administrator is the understanding. Does that, that make it a difference? Called. Well, it's clear under our code that code enforcement officers had the authority to enforce the code. It wasn't clear this position did, so we think it needs to be done as a code enforcement officer. It, it's a typo. Basically. We'll fix it. Okay. 
it's a code enforcement officer. Okay, just to clarify, that that is the, um, I think it is, this hasn't been posted, obviously, because we didn't approve it. So um, that's where I got it from, okay. All right, so motion, motion to approve as presented with the typo corrected to say officer in the job description. Right. Satisfy you, Commissioner Myers? Definitely. Perfect, all right, any further input? Uh, ordinance, Attorney Drake. In order to amend the FY 2024 annual operating capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide funding to the Building Inspection Department Code Enforcement Division for a short term rental coordinator position, vehicle and related operating expenditures, and for other purposes. All right, thank you, Attorney Drake. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, hearing none, motion carries. Uh, we're moving on to item 29, uh, which is the uh, loading zone on Meg Street. And I know you've composed a commission to find option. Commissioner Wright, so I want to turn it to you. Um, yeah, I hope that everybody, that the details were clear. Staff was really helpful. We had a good meeting on site. And we're going to start off with a smaller version so we can be clear that we have enough <coughs> loading zones on the safe side for the, that, those area businesses on Meg Street. So it'll only be one way from North Newton with this proposal to Prince, which is also improving safety from Prince not coming into that awkward point there. Um, it's going to improve um, safety and um, allow a little bit of training time for the delivery trucks to not be doing that on Prince Avenue right. for everybody's safety. So I make a motion for the commission to find option that's included in the packet. Do I hear a second? I'll second. All right, I've got a second from Commissioner Link. Um, Commissioner Link, any follow-up? Um, yeah, I, I met with Commissioner Wright and, and some of the business owners in, in the immediate vicinity. Um, we were told this is, it's kind of a pilot. Is, is that still the intention of this? Like the, the changes that are being proposed are not gonna be totally permanent. We're gonna let it play, is that, is that? I can clarify that it was um, the, the staff recommendation that's in the packet was from North Finley to Prince Avenue to be one way. And then the feedback that we got on site, um, the idea was to do this phase one and then have the design done for the complete because of the changes that will happen when North Finley gets open, people could actually circle around better, as well as getting the data to make sure we've got enough loading zone with phase one, and if we don't, phase two. Okay. And um, Manager Williams can also speak to two. There's a change that could be happening in the development on that parking lot um, to be north. Anyway. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being out there on site, you have to really see it to understand it. And I know you're intimately familiar with it, Commissioner Link. Um, what I would say is it is permanent, it's not temporary, but the phasing of it, we're just gonna tackle the first part, see how the behavior does, see okay. how the development un unwinds, and then we can come back and revisit it. Okay, okay. This is All a right, good compromise. Thank you. Any further input? <clears throat> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, and I'll have Attorney Drake read the ordinance and then we'll offer. In the code of Athens, Clark County, Georgia, with respect to establishing establishment of a loading zone along Meig Street, adding yellow curbing along Meig Street. Am I saying that correctly? Megs. 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 <laughs> That's what I thought. J Josiah Megs. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> I'm not a native Athenian. So. <laughs> I think Meg's is what Along you're Along Meg Street and making Meg Street a one-way street and for other purposes. But all right, and uh, to affirm now that Attorney Drake's read the ordinance, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion carries. All right, uh, item 30 is the Old Jefferson Road Sanitary Sewage Pump Station. This is approval of preliminary construction plan. Move to approve. Second. All right, got a motion from Commissioner Houle. And second from Commissioner Myers. Commissioner Houle, any remarks? Sure. If I had the chance to talk with staff before we had our agenda setting, the way I did, I think a day after, it would have been on our consent agenda. So this looks good. Commissioner Myers. I'm good. We approved this. This is just for the uh, construction plan, so I'm fine. Anything else from the body? <coughs> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right. Uh, item 31 is... Um, uh, additional funds for 853 Reese Street, the rehabilitation uh, 
completed by the Athens Land Trust. Move to approve. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Link. Who's the seconder? Second. Uh, seconder is Commissioner Hamby. Commissioner Link, any remarks? Yeah, I just want to thank staff for finding these funds to reimburse um, Athens Land Trust for the good work they've done in saving this historic property and, and effectively saving a, a block of this historic African-American neighborhood, um, maintaining the character, the historic character of the neighborhood and providing some perpetually affordable homes for folks. Any further input? All right. Appreciate the Athens Land Trust undertaking this project. Appreciate staff working with them so diligently through multiple phases. Um, given these are expenditures of funds, is there an ordinance, Attorney Drake? Uh, there's not an ordinance with it right now, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Uh, all, right. all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Motion carries. All right. Uh, item 32 is the RFP regarding the Unified Pay Plan Classification Comprehensive Study. Uh, and I know you had a commission to find option, Commissioner Houle, so I'll turn to you first. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'll make a motion to approve the CDO I submitted as presented in the agenda packet. Second. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Houle, second from Commissioner Thornton. Commissioner Houle, would you like to make remarks regarding this? Uh, I think I'll reserve them for if there's debate, but I do appreciate I, I, I've spoken to almost everybody behind the rail about this in advance of the meeting, and I, I'm glad that this will take us forward in a way that I think provide some clarity without uh, changing the, the scope of the, the work of the vendor. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Hu, I, I apologize for uh, shutting us off midstream, but Attorney Drake informs us there was an ordinance. Yeah. With I, I, the I don't already restream. checked on my list by mistake. I apologize. An ordinance to amend the FY 2024 annual operating <coughs> capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide additional funding for the historic Reese Street rehabilitation project and for other purposes. All right. Uh, so to affirm the uh, vote in item 31, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 31. All right. Motion carries. All right. Commissioner Houle, I apologize for interrupting. Uh, That's all right. I'm glad we're doing things in proper order. Uh, yeah. I, again, I'll, I'll reserve remarks for if there needs to be, uh, but I, I, I feel Commissioner good about this. I, I, I have no remarks. Sure. sure. I just have some questions, actually, yeah. and, and the questions deal with uh, the, uh, the, um, the direction that we're given to the manager, I mean, can, can either the attorney or Manager Williams speak to whether or not, I know that there was some concern last time that any change or modification to this changes the, the scope of the RFP and do, do you, I mean, do you see that happening, happening within this? I sent a memo that addresses, uh, my concerns related to this matter and uh you know the uh we talked last meeting about <coughs> that i expressed concerns there uh i think that the, the question is is whether or not we might get a potential challenge if <coughs> the question is you know generally when you do a change order it's an unexpected matter and uh as i said last time the commission needs to consider whether or not this is unex is unexpected. I guess I'm just wondering. Or can be seen as changing the scope. I mean, that's the question. Maybe I'm just asking the question. <coughs> um, just going from 1560 is what I guess is in the RFP yeah. right now listed. Well, I can speak from, to, to that. Going to that, to going to 1629. That doesn't, I don't have any real concern with that. Because okay. that's just changing a parameter. You follow what I'm saying? Right. It's like. Mm -hmm. That's not a concern. And the, and the D is uh, directing the manager to develop and propose a methodology. Mm -hmm. So is that something? I, I don't. I, I guess I can read it though. We're not asking the yeah, consultant right. to do that's that. That's right. That's what we're saying. We're not uh, asking we're the just, consultant to do it. But but I eventually, the manager speak for himself on what his. You help draft that language. What's intended. It, it seems to me you're going to have to get a consultant at some point to do that. Well, I didn't help draft the language. <laughs> County okay. attorney, I, I I ask that it not be developed and implement, but be developed and proposed because obviously it would come back here. Right. Um, well, but you don't. Do you know how to develop a methodology for for this? Well, when I say when you, I thought develop and propose was good because I took that it had to come back here. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Yeah. But obviously, I am going to talk to that consultant. Okay. I mean, I. You know, or, it has to be coordinated or with the it could go out for another RFP for some other consultant. For a unique or, job. It could, uh, and, and we could explore that with, with uh, the county attorney, but 
right now I can't talk to them, ask them what's possible or anything I like that. Until we approve something. That's right. So you do that. Obviously, I'll try and figure out and honor the CDO. Um, but I'll have to coordinate with them. If it becomes a scope issue, then we'll, re we'll visit with the county attorney at that time and find out if we have to go back out. Commissioner Davenport. So I'd like the motion to approve the staff recommendation. I'll second. All right, so I've got substitute motion from Commissioner Davenport, seconded from Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Davenport, remarks? Yeah, so I get the intent of uh, um, the CDO and what it is trying to approve, but um, this is something that I'm very passionate about, um, that when I came on, that we make sure we look at all of our staff and make sure we're paying them correctly. Um, I just remember when we implemented the 1560 plan, um, which I supported, um, I heard a lot of, I got a lot of feedback from constituents who actually work for Athens Park County who were upset that um, we're focusing on some of the people who are at the bottom of the run and not some of the people who are actually making a livelihood out of um, working with Athens Park County. But this whole process um, could have went about a, a different direction. Um, you know, use the wind. We want to implement a new policy. We get the five commissioners and we have a retreat and talk about it. This is just an attempt doing um, a paying compensation plan to implement a personal, um, you know, idea, which is, you know, I'm not against, but I, I just think we need to realize that we set out to do this. We do this every five years to look at everybody and not just the people at the bottom. And right now we implemented a plan two years ago of 1560, which causes cause a compression. So there are a lot of people at the 20, backing up, so there's some people at the $20 level who feel <coughs> left out because they've been with this county for 10 years and some of them started off at $9 an hour. And then we, we moved, you know, when I and another commissioner pushed for the $15, we worked with all the commission to get that passed. Um, and we didn't use um, any you know, we didn't have to do a CDO other than through the budget process, but what we, what we did was we, we, we worked with all the commissioners to get that passed, but when we did the 1560, what it did is cause compression, um, and a lot of our employees, the Athens Park County employees, got upset with that, and they feel that they've been here for 10, 15 years, and they're not getting the respect that some of these people are just getting started. I'm all for the, um, I'm just trying to make sure my, my light don't go out. I'm all for the plan, but I have a lot of questions about the budget. I have a lot of questions about how this is going to be implemented every year. Um, and we have other mechanisms to, to address um, the living wage issue. Um, and then I do have my thoughts on um, the, the living wage issue in itself, but that's for, um, that's for another day and another time. But... Um, but yeah, it, but hopefully I, I uh, but I have some more to say because I, my time is almost out. Commissioner Ray? Um, yeah, I agree with um, Commissioner Davenport's point. Um, I, I'm never uh, in favor of uh, scope creep um, of a project like this. Uh, uh, I mean, an agenda item that's coming before us, Mr. Merritt's uh, trying to approve the company uh, and the rate for this uh, request for proposal that went out. Um, it's supposed to be a straightforward, approve the selection of the company. And I think that these additional items being embedded into it is, um, it's just not, doesn't suit my way of doing business. So that's why I won't be supporting it. Thanks, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Myers. Yeah, I, I, I'm listening to my colleagues' concerns, and, and I, I hear them. Um, I do see this as, if I'm looking at D as the, the bigger issue, directing the manager to develop and pros a methodology for including the local, a local cost of living as a factor in the future recommendations uh, regarding employee classification compensation. It's very clear from my time on the commission that the manager, I cannot imagine him proposing or uh, any kind of methodology that would result in more salary uh, compression. Uh, that seems to not be something uh, that's one of his goals. So I would not expect that to, to come forward. Um, and 
So I, I'm ready to support this, and I hope also that when Siegel Company, uh, we have a work session with Siegel Company, and that the rest of us, um, that that will give us an opportunity to share with uh, each other and with the company uh, that the our belief in keeping that MIT living wage as a wage floor. We talk about affordable housing. We talk about uh, poverty. Oh, the one thing we can do here is we can't change the cost of living, the, the wages, and anywhere else but in athens Clark County. So I um, am committed with finding a way to move forward on this um, so that we can make those adjustments at a regular basis without the, the compression as well. Commissioner Thornton. Yes, we did. Um, we did have um, some collateral um, damage um, when we did that before, as Commissioner Davenport um, mentioned. And um, but I think that I'm supporting this because one, we're really giving the manager direction to go. Um, if there is. I, and I really was hoping that that the manager would have spoke to this vendor before tonight, but it's it, that that's over to over because I think there were some questions that I would have um, liked to have answered. But in the same respect, I will say that even though I am supporting the CDO tonight, I do not foresee and would support. Um, putting this back out to bid. If if the comp if the vendor does not feel comfortable with this, then so be it. So, but I, that was my big concern was I really felt this this should have been addressed a long time ago. It's almost just like the short term rentals. We got things just rolling down path, and now here we are. I will not support putting anything back out to bid because that would mean that um, it would take even longer. So I think we're giving the manager direction. I did talk to Commissioner Hull. Uh, MIT is one, med one institution. Maybe there is somebody out, but I agree. MIT is very stable. It's the institution. So, But, you know, that would be up to the manager, in my opinion. And just one very brief process question, Commissioner. Um, you know, I, I think one of the things we learned is that given that we have not signed the RFP yet, mm -hmm. the, the manager is very limited in the engagement oh, just, okay. that, that, of course, he can have with, with the vendor. Oh, I, okay. Thank so, you. S simply to clarify kind of the language that exists in the contract as is, but we can't do any of that sort of deeper dive until after tonight. So, um, thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Uh, Attorney Drake. I did. <clears throat> I talked to Commissioner Hill about this day. I did take it. I did look at the. I thought it might be a good idea if we talked. Look at the RFP. I looked at it. One thing I noticed that's unique about the RFP is it says that that group is supposed to come and have a meeting with the mayor and commission yes. to talk with you about yeah. your pay philosophy. Right, that's what I to. That might be the perfect time <coughs> to decide whether you want to do this as a body. But I know that doesn't satisfy you, Commissioner Hill, because you want to get it locked in right now. But I'm just saying you could do it then, but and then you don't have any issues. Yeah. You follow what I'm saying? That's just one thing to think about. And, and, and certainly I, I anticipate that uh, regardless of what happens tonight, that that will be a fruitful conversation uh, yeah. sh should we sign this contract. Uh, I've not heard from Commissioner Fisher, so I'm going to turn to you next. Um, and, I, and I hate being this dead horse. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has ever done compensation on this uh, commission but me. I've done this kind of work before, I understand. When I read both C and D and then went back to the RFP, I don't really see where the um, scope well, was affected, in my opinion. Um, and again, I'm not an attorney, but haven't done these in the past. And, and I've done it for cities and counties. Mm -hmm. So I understand, and, and they ask these type of questions. I do like the fact that um, the manager has the option. And when we talk about compression, I think, yeah, we can sit the... Um, the um, wage scale, but also we look at compression during that time also. Now, all this is going to um, um, come down to what our budget looks like, and can we afford to do it? That's that's going to be the bottom line. Mm -hmm. But the thing about any time you're talking about raising the bottom, you got to look at the compression that's involved in that. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, and you're right, um, 
commissioner, um, that um, some people who've been here for a long time felt like, well, somebody's coming off the street, making almost as much as me. But we have to address the compression issue. So, um, again, just, just, just realize that, and then when and if the um, company comes in and, and um, talk with us and meet with us, you know, we can ask these type of questions, but we can deal with the compression um, if we're going to raise the bottom. Matter of fact, we're going to have to deal with the compression. I ain't no, I ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about it, but the, there's a way to do that timing. But again, just keep in mind, because we're looking at our budget, make sure that the monies are there, to make sure we can do this. Commissioner Hull. Thank you, Mayor. And, and, and thank you to my colleagues. Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping that uh, my colleagues will still support the original motion on the floor for the commission to find option. We all know the cost of living is going up. Um, a living wage, as defined by the MIT living wage calculator for a single person without children, was 1562 years ago. So it's gone up, just like everything else. We all know about the cost of living, the cost of rent, the cost of housing, the cost of gas. It's all going up. Um, and, and we haven't adjusted our wage floor for that. And, and that's in part because the manager, you know, rightly pushed for us to do so in a structured way to address the compression that colleagues are speaking to. Um, so this CDO just does two things. Part C, it just clarifies that we want to use the current living wage figure of 1629 rather than the outdated figure of 1560, which is currently what, our, what we're paying. Um, but it's, that's being plugged into the exact same scope of work that the vendor's going to do, which is a structured analysis that will address compression. So it doesn't change anything about the nature of the work they have to do. It just changes what their figure is that they point to when they do it. Um, and then D, um, you know, it, D gives the manager clarity on how he moves forward. That may or may not require outside help from anyone, but it gives him clarity. Whatever work session we have with the vendor, this body is not giving the manager clarity on our belief in a living wage floor. Voting on this commission to find options tonight does. So whatever he does, not just with or without a vendor, but whatever he does moving forward with staff to develop things year in, year out, he'll, he'll be factoring that in. Um, so unlike what we've done in the past when we, when we did this in the budget amendments where staff did not like us doing that because of the compression issues, we're doing this as part of a structured analysis where compression will be addressed. Um, I think if we don't do this tonight, we run the risk of having to repeat those issues of st sticking it in the budget if we don't uh, approach it in a structured way. And echoing Commissioner Meyer's point, you know, I feel quite confident. I mean, this says direct the manager to develop and propose. Manager's probably going to talk with the consultant and HR staff and whoever else. But whatever he brings forward to us, I'm sure is going to address compression because that has been his one concern this whole time. Um, but I'd like to point out, you know, we're talking about raising the floor in a structured way. We talk a lot about a rising tide lifting all boats. So we're, we're raising that tide and it's going to lift all the boats in a structured way. I hope, I hope that we will commit to doing so with the current living wage for. Thanks. We've got uh, Commissioner Davenport and Thornton. So we just spent like three hours talking about legality of some of the um, of what other people have recommended. And now we, we got an email last week, two weeks ago, multiple times. We talked about it during work session that essentially you're changing the scope. I do not want my colleagues to lose the fact that there are literally, I remember when we did 15, 16, I proved that, that constituents, not even in my district and other people's district who complain about hey, I've been here for a long time. Why is that one commissioner always talking about the people at the bottom? We're losing, we're literally changing the scope to focus solely on the, um, the 16, the C and D, which is fine, I, I appreciate that. But let's not lose sight that every five years we revisit our comp paying compensation plan so we can make sure that our employees are getting paid fairly, not just those at the bottom. This original RIP clearly states that, hey, we're going to look at a living wage as well. So D does not make any sense. Like, why would we add more responsibility to, to blame when we, the commission, are in charge of the budget? Every year we do the budget. Every year we deal with pay. Every year we deal with um, people's classification, not classification, but with um, how much we distribute market rate. So this, and then it's not even binding. Future commissioners can come in and say, okay, well, I don't like this. Let's change it. 
So why would we set ourselves up for that failure in the first place? But just please just don't forget why we do pay compensation study every five years. I remember one former employee, first thing we talked about was the paying compensation the paying compensation study. And every time this issue comes up, we lose sight because of one commissioner always talking about, which I agree, we need to do it. But let's just please folks just don't don't just let's get it right. At work session, we already said that it come back to us to be talked about. <coughs> and that's when we get to decide, do we want to go below market rate, market rate, or above market rate? In the RIP, it clearly states that we, we um, they're going to address the situation of compression with um, living wage. This is just, yeah. So, I, I'm, that's all. Well, I'll come back around and get one more time. Okay. I've got uh, Commissioner Thornton and then Commissioner Myers. Well, this is going to, I hope I stay here um, long enough to vote because I'm packing up, um, and that's serious. So I don't know how many times you're going to get to come back around before, before I leave. But um, I went to the when I went to the uh, and the several commissioners were there. The uh, arena announcement had the big thing. The yeah uh, yeah where are we at? Top, yeah. top top and off and. Um, the guy, the gentleman spoke, and he was so proud. He said, and we are so glad that we're going to be able to pay a livable wage of 1561 And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, by the time that arena is built, that is not going to be a livable wage. But he was so proud. And that means I know he has no understanding about livable wages. Um, I still am going to support this. Hopefully I can get to vote for it tonight um, because it gives direction to our manager that we, I felt a little bit like my arm was twisted the last time. I really did. I really felt a little bit because I'm with EJC and da -da. I do feel, I do think this gives us more, um, this gives us and some options. Now again, I'm not going to vote on um, sending out another RFP. So hopefully the, the vendor will be amenable. Got that, Commissioner Myers. Well, one, let me clarify for myself at least that the way I'm reading it, it does not guarantee that we're putting out or giving the vendor some other uh, task. We may well be, but it's not a guarantee. Um, second of all, I, I don't, I must, I, I, perhaps I'm missing something. Um, I don't see how this creates more compression. Uh, what I see this is, is a methodology for dealing with the compression and dealing with the fact that we want to give a livable wage at the same time so we don't have to go through this again and again and again. Um, now, the manager may develop and propose this. We don't have to accept it. Maybe we'll have it all figured out during that nice work session when we talk, and the manager will come back and say, do you still want me to develop and propose that? Because you all got it together, um, which is, should be having, according to the uh, timeline for Siegel, should be happening pretty quickly. Um, so unless I'm missing something, I don't see what, how this CDO creates compression going forward. Um, so that's all I have to say. And, and I had my last comment. I'm expiring. I move to call the question. Thank you. Yeah. Second. A motion to call the question. Is there a second? second? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and move to a roll call on the substitute motion first. What's the, the substitute, substitute motion? motion is, is Commissioner Davenport's motion, motion to, to just affirm the staff recommendation. Oh, okay. okay. Davenport? Yes. Link? No. Taylor? Yes. Wright? Yes. Fisher? No. Poole? No. Culpepper? No. Myers? No. Thornton? No. Hamby? Yes. Four yes, six no. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll return to the original motion for the CDO. Who? Yes. Culpepper? Yes. Fires? Yes. Thornton? Yes. Hamby? Yes. Davenport? No. Link? Yes. Taylor? Yes. 
Right. No. Fisher. Yes. One, two, three. Eight yes, two no. All right, thank you, Madam Clerk. Motion carries. All right, um, we are going to consider three items under suspension of rules. I need a motion for suspension of rules. So moved. Second. I've got a motion from Commissioner Wright and a second from Commissioner Link for suspension of rules. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, hearing none, motion carries. All right, uh, item 33 was brought forward by the uh, uh, Sheriff's Office as there is a uh, grant funding opportunity that they have received. I'd uh, entertain a motion for approval. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Hamby. A second from Commissioner Myers. There's an ordinance given that there's a grant. I'm going to have Attorney Drake read that. An ordinance to amend the FY 2024 annual operating and capital budget for Athens, Clark County, Georgia, so as to provide grant funding if awarded from the Georgia Department of Public Health, DPH, Georgia Southern University Confinement Facilities COVID-19 Mitigation Project to, minim to minimize potential opportunities for exposure to infectious diseases within the jail facility and for other purposes. Thanks, Attorney Drake. Uh, any, any remarks, Commissioner Hamby? No, ma'am. Or no, sir. Ready to vote. Yeah. Commissioner Myers. No, ju uh, just a quick thank you to the sheriff's uh, office for uh, looking into these uh, grant opportunities that would provide a healthier physical environment for uh, everyone involved at the jail. Any more input from the body? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion carries. All right, we're going to move on to item 34. Uh, this is a resolution dedicating the Vince Dooley Memorial Intersection, which is at the corner of West Broad Street or Highway 78 and uh, Lumpkin Street. And this, uh, in, in some ways, uh, affirms what was already done by the General Assembly. I'd uh, entertain a motion for this. So moved. Second. All right, I've got a motion from Commissioner Wright and a second from Commissioner Davenport. Commissioner Wright, would you like to uh, well, I would uh, just describe like to your say favorite we'll do, memory of Yeah, well, no, there's Kids just Cooley. too many. We don't, it's too late for any of the memories. So too late. But it was a great ceremony when this was dedicated, and you can see the signs, and I wanted the county manager to um, speak to the fact that we don't have an intersection accepting – anyway, would you please explain what, what got us to this point? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Briefly. Thank you. Briefly. Yes, we've got Maybe. street naming, but not intersections and not bridges. So in the next cycle, you can look forward to that policy. But for now, I'm working with the county attorney, this is, uh, accomplishes and allows us to put this on a job. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a, um, an idea to have some more signs so that people don't go out in the middle of the intersection to have her picture made with that in there. We want to keep them on the sidewalk. Yeah. Um, so this gets us officially accepting this. Um, and so that's my motion to accept the resolution for accepting the name change. It came at the state level. Appreciate it, Commissioner Wright. Commissioner Davenport, any follow-up remarks? Oh, sorry I missed the ceremony, but look forward to we'll drive by that intersection almost every day. So look forward to continue to look at it. Any further remarks from the body? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, item 35 is a resolution to authorize the Classic Center Authority to use uh, the series 2021, 22, and 23 bond proceeds for the purpose of acquiring fixtures, furnishings, and equipment. Uh, so these are funds already allocated to this purpose. This just means that um, we do not have to approve funding of their dishes and the like. So move. Second. All right. Got a motion from Commissioner Hamby and second from Commissioner Davenport. Commissioner Hamby, any remarks? Nope. Commissioner uh, Davenport. Briefly, we do. Um, uh, our committee met and we just. Um, it's getting late, sorry. So, our committee met to address, um, talk about bonds with the crisis center. So, we, we decided to meet four times a year. So, quarterly minus July. Yeah, four months. All right. Just to keep in touch, and we're learning a lot. It's a good committee. Thank, Thank you. you for the update. I appreciate that. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right. uh, hearing none, motion carries. All right, so uh, now is that time in the evening when we have resident input on any item that is not on tonight's agenda. Uh, rules of resident input are the same as uh, for the others. Uh, for each resident, we need to know your full name, first and last name, and your place of residence. Um, and then you will have three minutes. And again, there is a clock in front of Clerk Spratlin. It will turn green when you begin speaking, yellow when you have 30 seconds remaining, 
and red when your three minutes has expired. Uh, as with earlier, I just ask everybody to listen silently so we can hear everything said by the speakers. So, um, Clerk Spratlin is ready, so good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Cece Webb. I was born in Athens and have lived here for most of my adult life. I sent a version of uh, this speech um, as an email to Mayor Gertz on January 10th. Um, I never received an answer, so I decided to update it uh, and say it here in hopes of maybe getting more of a response. Uh, you might remember me as the December 5th public comment speaker who asked whether the commission was going to ask us to sit down and shut up in regards to an Athens ceasefire resolution. We came into that December 5th meeting angry, scared, and desperate. For two months, we had watched a genocide play out across our phone screens. Our Palestinian friends were, and still are, suffering losses of a profound and devastating nature, yet we were repeatedly dismissed and ignored by the institutions built to support us, including UGA. We came to City Hall that night because we had exhausted all of their options. We may not have approached the commission with the most skill, the best strategy, the friendliest attitude, but we approached in good faith. Admittedly, we also came expecting to once more be dismissed and criticized, and we were not disappointed in that expectation. We were condemned as privileged and belligerent. Still, we continued to organize and felt what we made what we felt to be real headway in our goal. Now we come to find out, Mayor Gertz, uh, that although you would not say so for your constituents on camera, you refuse to allow a ceasefire resolution on the agenda. This decision you have made after your many years in local government because you believe that an open letter will be more effective in forwarding federal support for a ceasefire in Gaza. The questions I have are, if this is true, why didn't you sign the Jewish Voice for Peace ceasefire letter that was sent to you by one of your constituents? Why does a ceasefire resolution have to be replaced by an open letter? Why, if you claim to be interested in state or nationwide efforts, do you refuse to support a resolution that directly appeals to those very federal powers who you, some weeks ago, said we should be calling instead? Why, in the face of a literal genocide, and I am not here to convince anybody that it's a genocide, we do have leaflets if you want to be convinced or learn about it, uh, why in the face of a genocide that is affecting residents in our community should we not exercise every possible measure we can take, even as a small Georgia town across the ocean from Palestine? Under your dismissal is a fundamental misunderstanding of what it is we're fighting for and what it is to organize as a community. People are dying. People just like us are dying and suffering horrifically, painfully, unnecessarily, and so publicly that the people of Gaza seem to mourn for a living. They have had the privacy of grief stolen from them just so that they can try to evoke some sympathy from the Western powers who have the power to stop their genocide. And we know for a fact that our federal government is funding and supplying this genocide. We are trying to change the moral fabric of America for the better. We are trying to stop imperialist exploits that harm and kill people every year who are no different, no less civilized, and no less feeling than we are. I would argue at this point in the West, humanity and civility have declared themselves dead. Thank you, Ms. Webb. I appreciate you coming tonight. It's not Miss. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Jacqueline Austin, and I'm not a native of uh, Athens, Georgia. I'm a native of Detroit, Michigan. So I came uh, from the north to the south. And what I've already heard is a struggle that many of us have throughout the United States is that of, of inclusion. So what I'm asking you is to consider everything that you all have voted on, that you talked about, that you discussed, and consider the people first. The people are always first. Uh, consider a livable wage. I'm also an organizer and an advocate as well, which means I fight for what's right and I am for the little person. So I'm asking that you look into and revisit those things that you consider, eh, it's something you can throw in the garbage, file 13, whatever it is that you do with those things. But I think a livable wage, considering the fact that Detroit, like any other city, like Athens, like any other city, like Atlanta, like any other state, we all have those so-called American dreams. So. I'm saying that to say to you, being a visitor here, nothing has changed. Being a looking forward to a permanent resident here, nothing has changed. 
throughout our core, our fibers, our beliefs, those things that we hold true, those things that our forefathers fought for. If you sit here every day and you take no light of that and you b take a blind eye, trust me, it will come back to haunt you. It will do that in such a way that your history will speak of it long after everyone in this room is gone. So I'm going to support those that fight. I have that spirit in me to fight for what's right. And that's all I ask is that you consider those things here in your city of Athens, Georgia. Your people matter. And to the young lady, Miss Tiffany, I love your enthusiasm. I like your fight of your fight. It's not that you're you 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 spoke you brought something in me that had something to do with the fact that when you are looked upon and you are kicked under the rug and you think or just it it, it, it it's 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 not it's not a feeling that no one likes, but it's a feeling that you are going to have to recognize. The people are first. The people have rights. And do not look at us as just something to throw under the rug. We have rights. Give us that. Give us that. A livable wage is nothing to frown on when rent is high. Thank you, Jacqueline. I appreciate you coming tonight. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Elle Lewis, and I've returned once again to ask for a ceasefire resolution. I'm here again because in a truly disappointing turn of events, um, Kelly Gertz sent an email with a few inaccuracies uh, that seem to have discouraged some commissioners from meeting with their very own electorates. These were people who were unable to make these meetings because of work or childcare scheduling, people who live in your districts and wanted to meet with you, the people you said you wanted to hear from, Jewish residents as well. And so Gertz sent this email because he said his experience as an educator allows him to see that these secondary tertiary campaigns are ineffective. So I thought I should talk about my experience and my background. Before I was a business owner, I was a campaign manager and I worked on issue-based campaigns. The last two campaigns I worked on were passing the minimum wage and paid sick days in Connecticut. We were able to pass these bills with the full weight of several multi-billion dollar corporations because of what you called secondary tertiary campaigns. Getting local politicians on our side to really amplify the voices of their constituents who needed a living wage and who needed paid sick days to pass. So um, this was done and done because of the involvement of local politicians. This is what this ceasefire resolution would do. It helps to cut through the noise of lobbyists. We have powerful defense contractors in APAC talking to our senators and our representatives. A ceasefire resolution helps to cut through that noise and that chaos. And so that is why I know that this is an effective strategy. Given my background and my history as well, I've also learned to recognize when something becomes a mobilizing moment for voters. And so not only does this issue of mass death and 31,000 people killed with 40 million US dollars and American made weapons, not only does that become a mobilizing issue, how the commission has reacted to our calls for a ceasefire, that becomes a mobilizing issue. Hearing that our commissioner thinks that we are not as important as other things she has going on, that's something that makes people ready to go out and knock on doors and talk about the lack of regard that commissioners have for their constituents. So given that 31,000 people killed in a matter of months will not move you, I'm hoping that letting you know 
inaction at this moment is not an option. Thank you, Al. I appreciate you coming this evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Morgan Tate, and I'm a permanent resident. I'm at 1909 South Millage Avenue. As my commissioner, Commissioner Hamby noted earlier, it is your job to be responsive to the constituents of Athens. I, like many people before me, have asked you to stand with Palestinian and Jewish Athenians who are being psychologically harmed by this genocide, paid for by our tax dollars. Though I'm not Jewish, nor am I Palestinian, I have, dis I have struggled with dis anxiety and deep despair, watching as Palestinian children are shot at point-blank murdered in the street with bullets paid for by our tax dollars. Paid for by our tax dollars. The speed and intensity of this genocide is disturbing. You have the power, like many other cities across the country that have done so, so far, to demand a ceasefire. Calling for a ceasefire is the very least that we can do to ensure the emotional safety of Athenians, as well as the fiscal responsibility you bear in making sure our tax dollars are used wisely. This is a campaign issue for me in future elections. Thank you for taking your responsibilities for Athenians and to Athenians very carefully and seriously. And I appreciate <coughs> previous attempts to deal with injustice such as Linentown. We can also do this here for now with our Palestinian Americans in Athens, as well as our Jewish Athenian Americans as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Morgan. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Julian Nyunt. I moved to Athens in 2021 to attend UGA, and I liked it so much I decided to stay. I'm also a U.S. Army veteran. I'm a musician, and I'm a music teacher, and I'm a Jew. Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, 46, of Carrollton, Georgia, Specialist Kennedy Layden Sanders, 24, of Waycross, Georgia, and Specialist Brianna Alexandria Moffat, 23, of Savannah, Georgia, died January 28th of this year in Jordan. We mourn these fallen American soldiers. They were killed, likely in their beds, by a drone. The drone was linked to Iran and Russia. These three soldiers were from Georgia, and they were all African American. Is a soldier who calls Athens home next? Mayor Gertz, please tell us again that what happens in Gaza has nothing to do with what happens here in Athens. Please tell us again that you don't care about the soldiers recruited at events like Athfest. Please tell us again their death was inevitable, that you could do nothing while you did nothing, while you refused to do what you could so that you didn't have to be inconvenienced, disliked by people who you think matter more than soldiers do, matter more than the civilians in Gaza do, matter more than we do people that you fear more than you fear us. Since October 7th, since Israel began its retaliatory barrage on Palestinian civilians, there have been more than 150 attacks on US forces in the Middle East. In response to this drone strike that killed three of our fellow Georgians, the US has retaliated by attacking a multitude of locations in Iraq and Syria. What the US is doing in the region is clearly escalating aggression. This aggression puts the lives of American soldiers at risk. And for what reason? How are the lives of people here in Athens improved by aggression in the Middle East, enriched by the murder of 26,000 Palestinians, including almost 12,000 children? How are the lives of people here in Athens affirmed by events in Gaza like these? A child came in alive, literally burnt to the bone. Their hands were contracting. Their face was just charcoal. And they were alive and talking, and we had no morphine. These are the words of a Dr. Harrington from the UK. This was from a BBC article. This is what the US is funding, what Athens is funding, and what our soldiers are supporting through proxy conflicts. This is what we are putting our soldiers' lives on the line for. Mayor Gertz, you and I exchanged emails in the past about how this aggression would likely lead to war for the US. You responded telling us to write a letter. We did, and it's still sitting in your mailbox waiting to be signed. Veterans like myself will remember that you slept safe in your own bed, refusing to do what little you could while soldiers were being ordered to kill children and being killed in their sleep. That will be your legacy. Or you can stand up for the people of Athens, stand up for the soldiers calling Athens home, stand up for justice and democracy, and allow a ceasefire resolution on the agenda. Thank you, Julianne. I appreciate you coming tonight. Thank you. 
Good evening. Good evening. My name is Catherine Littlepage. Um, I am 27 and I am a Athens resident since 2017. Um, I am, I've been a legally disabled worker since 2017 or 2019. Uh, this is relevant because it re represents my current walk of life and how I feel about the rental market in Athens um, after having rented here since 2017. Um, as Americans, we're realizing how interconnected our struggles are, especially since the beginning of October. Um, I'm asking our city commissioners to continue considering our Palestinian neighbors' voices during this time. Um, I'm here to support the interests of Athens Against Apartheid as the most accessible way for us as a community to do everything we can. Um, I ask Athens Clark County to take an official stance against the atrocities that are closer to home than we wish to acknowledge, uh, particularly race and police brutality issues. Um, that I fear could escalate uh, if Atlanta's cop city would come to fruition. Um, I humbly ask that you consider anything in your power to uplift and protect these voices, uh, whether they are students, um, concerned citizens such as myself, um, and Palestinian Americans and allies. Uh, a ceasefire resolution has been presented forth to you all. Um, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Dylan Woolsey, 395 River Road. Um, I'm glad that you all passed the short-term um, rental regulations here tonight, but as many people said, um, these are not enough to curb um, the workforce um, housing lack, um, lack of supply in Athens, Georgia. And so what is uh, needed as um, adding on to what additional planning uh, zoning has been done to allow for more density the, in the upcoming budget um, the approved plans from last year of the more uh, workforce housing, such as the land trust, uh, sorry, the land housing fund acquisition, I think it was called, might be mis uh, saying that name, um, that and other factors, um, other recommendations from that uh, affordable housing study that were accepted by the commission, these would be very good steps to develop more um, supply of workforce housing here in Athens. And um, I think it should that, but that should all these measures should be considered in the budget that is going to be developed over the next uh, few months. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Good evening. Good evening. Um, hello, my name is Colin Cochran. I'm a fourth generation UGA student, and while not from Athens Clark County, I do consider it my second home. I've been coming down here at least two to three times a year since I was eight years old. I've come down here for football games and just for summer vacation. You may not be able to hear it in my name, but I am Palestinian. My mother family goes back longer than there are records in Palestine. The, my, and yet, between 1948 and 1957, they fled. I am lucky. I have not had to endure, endure the harsh realities of occupation in the West Bank city of Ramallah, where my family is from. But I do have guilt. Why do I get to live a cushy middle class life while my own people are ch jailed tortured, killed, and now blatantly genocide. I know some of you are for a ceasefire resolution, and some, are your, some of you are completely against it. I'm not here to convince you how to vote. I'm here to convince you that it is your job to put a resolution on the floor. I understand how important local government is. To Mayor Gertz, and maybe to the rest of you on this council, the last name Cochran may sound familiar. My grandfather is Tom Cochran, and is the CEO and executive director of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Growing up, my, father, my mother and my father both worked with mayors and my father for the governor of New York. There is a reason organizations like the U.S. Conference of Mayors and the National League of Cities exist. I've grown up talking to mayors about the work that they do. City governments hear people. Party politics are not exaggerated, exaggerated because cities need to run. I agree that passing a resolution does nothing immediately, but local government, especially ones with large constituencies like athens Clark County, send a message when passing a resolution like this one. It says we are against genocide. It says we know what the people want. And most importantly, it says that we listen to all of our people, the people with no real political power or constituencies, people whose land has been occupied, 
and whose self-determination has been denied. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Colin. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Deller Weldon, and I'm a student at the University of Georgia and a temporary resident of Athens District 4. First, I want to thank those of y'all who have responded to us with respect. As my peers have said before, we have been turned away and ignored many times, but we hope to keep building bridges and addressing issues directly pertaining to Athens. And we will not stop talking about Palestine. This is not the only issue that we care about. We also care about the housing crisis in Athens, a topic that we've brought up in conjunction with Gaza before. While we cannot order an immediate ceasefire ourselves, we can at least conscientiously object to Athens taxes being used to carpet bomb civilians. These funds could go towards any number of local projects from housing to harm reduction, all sorts of infrastructure. This isn't just an economic issue, this is a genocide. I know that y'all care about people. Y'all care about making our social, economic, and physical environments safer and healthier for the people with whom you live. If you didn't, you wouldn't have run for these positions. It takes a great deal of effort and care to do y'all's jobs, and I do commend you for it. But we don't just live in Athens, we live on Earth. The only true difference between us Athenians and Palestinians is the circumstances of our births. The federal government is using y'all's city's tax money to orchestrate this genocide. The least we can do is conscientiously object to it. To anyone who believes that Athens doesn't have the ability to impact federal and even international affairs, you greatly underestimate your power. Athens has long been a political hotspot and we've had a strong influence many times, including during election seasons just like this year. Justice in Palestine is an issue of great significance to voters and constituents, and it would be wise to address it. All humans deserve to live with freedom and dignity. The Palestinian people are no exception. The safety of the Jewish people, of my people, my family, my friends, cannot, does not, and will not come at the expense of the safety of Palestinians. Criticism of Israel is only anti-Semitic if you believe that Israel represents all Jews, and it most certainly does not. I am proof of that. The fact that I can be accused of hate speech for criticizing the actions of a state that's committing a genocide in my name, that I can be accused of hatred and violence against my own people for defending our fellow humans' right to live, is, it's insane to me. My whole life, I've been taught that one of the core beliefs of our faith is tikkun olam, or repairing of the world. It holds that, among many other things, wherever we are, it is our duty to make the world a better place to live for everyone. We all deserve freedom and dignity, all of us. And if we don't call out and condemn a genocide now, when will we? Thank you for your time. Shalom. Thank you, Della. Good evening. Hello, my name is Nick Tobin. I live on 101 Woodlake Drive off Epps Bridge Parkway. Uh, I have something perhaps a little more close to home to discuss today. I would like to uh, ask about the extent and enforcement of noise ordinances. So as you transit around athens Clark County, you might not notice the sheer volume of vehicles that pass you or that you pass every day. And that is because the majority of vehicles can operate in a way that is not necessarily disruptive. However, you might also notice the volume audibly of some other vehicles that pass you every day uh, in the sense that it is I'm just going to say obnoxious, but we'll say disruptive. The athens Clark County noise ordinances are motivated by the idea that they are to reduce, excuse me, reduce excessive community noises, which are harmful and otherwise detrimental to the enjoyment of life and property. Uh, section 3-5-24C1A and 3-5-24C2A both refer to mechanical sound making devices at different parts of the day. I am uncertain if those apply to vehicles in their normal operation or not. And I believe the police department is also uncertain of such because when I called them to inquire, they encouraged me to come speak with you. And so here I am today. But it has been established, I think there's a legal precedent, that you have the ability to regulate noise making within the county. Uh, it's not explicitly stated for vehicles in motion, but there are a variety of other reasons why we might regulate noise, including man-made noises, 
uh, construction noises, yard work, and so on. The state of Georgia prohibits vehicular noises emanating from a stereo within the vehicle at a distance of over 100 feet. So if you can hear a stereo within the car over 100 feet, that is in violation of Georgia state law. I request that you follow a similar pattern as what has been set by your own noise ordinances and Georgia state law with the operational noises of vehicles, even if they do not emanate from a stereo. <laughs> We would have a problem if someone drove around lighting fireworks off on the side of his car. We would ask him to stop. If someone walked around blaring a hand, an air horn out his windows, we would ask him to stop. And yet, many of these vehicles in their operation, by virtue of their operation, are substantially more disruptive. So why do we tolerate that? Um, I would argue that enforcement, once measures are established, would not be especially difficult because by virtue of the offense, the offender calls attention to himself. I know I'm short on time, so I'm asking you to make it explicit that our noise ordinances prohibit excessive vehicular noise and encourage the police department to begin enforcement of such an ordinance. Um, please return to Athenians the serenity that I think we deserve. Thank you, Thank you very much for your time. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Ezra Lewis, and I am an Athens resident of District 4. And I just wanted to bring up a couple points. Um, number one is that global problems are local concerns. Um, that we are clearly all concerned. Um, there's a rise of Islamophobia. There's a, our lives have been threatened multiple times by other Athenians, um, ours being the Students for Justice in Palestine. Um, you know, and the rise of co the co HB 30 happening, codifying co criticisms of Israel occupations as anti-Semitic. I, I, basically, the point I'm trying to say is everyone would love to imagine that they would stand against oppression back in the old days when it's not happening at the time, such as slavery or the Holocaust. Um, but it takes, that takes effort and political will. And so I just really hope that you guys can find it within the, yourselves to take the political will to support a ceasefire and put it on the put it on the agenda. There has been 56 local ceasefire resolutions in the United States that have been passed. Um, 16 are currently on the agenda, and 22 have been rejected, and that's a total of 94. So there is a precedent for local municipal um, organizations. You know what I'm trying to say. Um, to, for it to be on the agenda. So I just ask that you listen to your constituents and put it on the agenda so that we can have these conversations. And in the, in the face of divisiveness, because I know that's something that we're concerned, y'all are concerned about, is that this divisiveness already exists and it's currently happening. The violence has been against the people that have been fighting for this, um, both verbally and physically. So I just really ask that by acknowledging this issue that this will promote um, further communication and further um, unity within the community. And I just really ask that you at least acknowledge what we're, what we're asking and just put it on the agenda so that people can voice their opinions. Thank you. Thank you, Ezra. Good evening. How's it going? Uh, my name's Ian. I live on um, 128 Lake Drive. Um, uh, I come up here, I want to talk about the atrocities going on in Gaza, um, about the families destroyed, the lives ruined. Um, taken, people, lives lost, um, and the, just everything that this commission seems to not have much of a problem with. Um, you know, last night in a college town very similar to ours, uh, Austin, Texas, uh, very similar in how the, you know, it's a college town, um, a student was shot um, um, for wearing a kafia from leaving something like this after they were at a protest or some type of event. Um, and you guys still don't think that this is like an issue that the local politics doesn't get involved with larger uh, geopolitical things. Um, I just think that this is ridiculous. Um, you know, um, this is a, a swing state this year. Um, um, sorry. Um, um, Many of you, uh, as, I've made as you've made clear, think that this ceasefire is a young, idealistic fantasy. Many students are extremely concerned and are registered to vote in Athens. And those who are not registered here, they come from Gwinnett, many whom come from Gwinnett County, or similar counties like this, 
Gwinnett County particularly is a very heavy um, uh, immigrant uh, county and uh, a lot of the students who come to UGA who you might think don't vote here or don't care or they're young or they're not registered here, they register there, they vote there or they vote here. Many of them are registered to vote here because it's easier to vote in your town, in your local municipality when you are in school. Um, these people will be voting in November. They will be voting. Um, so I just, I hope that you consider these things. These are also people, they're not just students who are just gonna leave at some point. They're citizens, this is a swing state. A lot of them are registered here. The, the youth vote is gonna be very important for the progressive side of things next year. And it's not gonna happen um, if people are continually disparaging of young people who are trying to get involved with the political process. So thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, good evening, Broderick Flanagan, uh, PO Box 295. Um, again, I do um, commend the organizing of these students um, for the Athens Against Apartheid. Um, I do support, personally support, um, putting a ceasefire resolution on the agenda. Um, I didn't really come to, uh, like, initially come to speak to that this evening, uh, but I do feel like it is important that we do what we can. Um, Chicago uh, actually passed a, or a ceasefire resolution, I believe it was last week, um, and it does send a message um, that the chamber e erupted in applause. Um, and so I'll just leave that, you know, at that. Please put it on the agenda. And for the commissioners who said they would meet with these, these groups, um, I hope you honor those uh, commitments. Um, and for you, Commissioner Taylor, I want to commend you uh, for the courage and vulnerability you showed tonight. Um, it gives me hope to see you stand up for your community in that way. Um, I want to say I appreciate that deeply. Um, and it gives me a lot of hope for, for future work and future generations to come. So people are watching. Um, and then lastly, I want to speak to uh, Mayor Gertz. You and I spoke about uh, the ARPA funds with the workforce development. Um, you told me that, you know, uh, after I came to the, the meeting to speak about the facilitator, the original facilitator of that bucket of money um, being kind of lopsided towards the business side of things because the, bu the bucket is put together business and workforce development. And so when you have uh, somebody from the Chamber of Commerce facilitating that meeting, um, which I'm grateful that that has, that has been revisited, but I feel like the last time we spoke about it, you said y'all couldn't find a facilitator. So I'm trying to figure out what's going on with that advisory committee that's supposed to be meeting since March of last, I mean not March, but August of last year from the documents that I read online about the ARPA funding. Um, the, the advisory committee, which is made up of several local organizations, has supposed to be meeting monthly since August. And so uh, there are two ways to create affordable housing and to eradicate food insecurities and things of that nature. Um, you can build housing at a certain price point, which you all have said behind this rail that you can't force the private market to build at a certain price point. And then you can also help people to exercise their rights under the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act. Like those federal laws exist for a reason to help balance out the exploitation of certain workers' experience in certain companies and certain working conditions. And so you can help or, or support or, uh, organizations and people who are organizing or showing people how to exercise their rights under the NLR NLRA to organize for better working conditions, to improve their working conditions. A commissioner earlier spoke about quality of life. This is related to quality of life and, and what we are allowing to happen to, to low-wage workers here in Athens, in this community. So I hope we have conversations about that soon. Thank you, Broderick. I appreciate it very much. All right. Uh, now is the time when we uh, have reports from uh, myself, staff, and commissioners. Um, I earlier noted, of course, there were two assignments. Uh, immediately to government operations to revisit any uh, additional recommendations that they would have about short-term rentals uh, in the wake of tonight, uh, and also to the Planning Commission uh, to work with the attorney to create a text amendment uh, to allow the mayor and commission to modify a Planning Commission text amendment, which we currently lack. Uh, and then I uh, also need to note uh, on the record that Commissioner Link is serving as the uh, commission liaison to the Community Tree Council. Uh, so that said, um, we'll go ahead and um, go to uh, charter officers. Um, Andrew Williams, anything tonight? No report. Uh,
Attorney Drake? No report. Uh, Auditor Just Hassimer? Quick things, Mayor. Uh, draft of the periodic audit of the tax assessor's office <coughs> was presented to the audit committee at their last meeting in anticipated action um, by them in March. Also, I sent each of you a copy of the 2024 Peace Cub work plan for your review. Um, it highlights the previous year's accomplishments as well as uh, their goals for the upcoming year and um, things to accomplish in the coming months. If you have any questions about that, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, we will go around uh, the room and uh, hear from commissioners. We'll begin with uh, Commissioner Fisher tonight. We'll end with Commissioner Hull. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the mayor that I met with the High Ridge um, HOA a couple of weeks ago. Also, I met with the uh, Woodhaven HOA. Um, this Saturday, the Howard B. Stroud Health Symposium will be held at um, Piedmont Athens Regionals beginning at 9 a.m. going to 12 noon. Um, the Youth Task Force with CCSD and AC, ACC Gov will be on tomorrow school board office um, beginning at 5 p.m. And I um, just want to, um, and I hope the community saw what's sort of went on here tonight um, with, with the commissioners. You know, we can all disagree and then try to come together and try to get um, things accomplished. So I uh, just want to thank my colleagues. Um, you know, I, I never get upset when um, things don't go my way. I mean, you win some, you lose some, and that's okay. But again, you know, as a... Um, a body, you know, we try to do things to better this community, and I'm just glad that we we made some compromises and, and try to get to um, where we need to go as a commission. So hopefully we'll continue these type of debates in the future when um, we think there are critical issues in this community that come before us and, and try to get things done. Thank you. Um, due to the late time and that we have a meeting after this meeting, I'm just going to pass on my comments for tonight. I will... <coughs> I would like to um, thank my colleagues, thank staff for all of your hard work, and you guys out there with that um, ceasefire. Y'all keep going. Keep going. Keep going. I'm proud of y'all. Don't, don't, don't. Don't jump me after this. That's it. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody, um, all my colleagues and staff for holding down the fort. As I've, I've been out of town most of the last three weeks. Um, I was privileged enough to be able to be by my father's side in his final days and to travel with my mom for my uncle's funeral in, in the Bronx. So I've um, had a lot going on, and I really appreciate everyone's understanding, and I'm still catching up. Thank you. Yeah. Um Thank y'all for this meeting today. It was long. We got through it. 30 something items. I'll thank my colleagues for, um, you know, dredging the water and getting through this. Um, so we did all of my colleagues, just in case you missed this, we got some emails from IT support, some of these trainings. So I was told to educate y'all to make sure they're like 45 minutes long, some are 15 minutes long, but there's about six of them. If y'all can get that done um, and also participate in ACC wellness and that's it. Commissioner Hamby? Oh, sorry, thank you. He, uh, I was, Pat, Patrick said something about training and I didn't I'd have to figure that one out. But I um, want to thank staff uh, for uh, the, the, the um, town hall they did with um, Commissioner Wright and Commissioner Culpepper and myself, uh, Chief Salters, Blaine, Bruce, Lonnie, and, um, and, um, Tim Griffith. We had about 100 or so folks there. It was well attended and, good, and a good good discussion. And Commissioner Thornton was there and Commissioner Dexter as well. So appreciate y'all uh, uh, being there as well. Speaking of Tim Griffith, I do have a, a, I could turn this into Gene, but a work order. This may be uh, more than just a, a work order. Um, this morning I got a phone call. There was a there was a, a, a Jeep that had jumped over the curb over on 230 uh, Meadowview. And um, there used to be a guardrail up there a number of years ago. If y'all remember, if you go down Bobbin Mill past the radio station and you go around that sharp curve, uh, a Jeep, I guess, didn't make the curve and went into an individual's yard. And, uh, and so they were asking about perhaps revisiting that guardrail issue to see if, they, uh, see if it's a possibility. Um, so, and uh, police probably have a report of the accident as well. 
Uh, and I also want to address, um, uh, I think it's Mr. Tobin, uh, and I want to say that uh, LRC at some point uh, discussed the uh, loud vehicle noises, and maybe we could dig those minutes back up. I don't know who was chair of the, of the committee at that point, but uh, maybe dig those minutes back up and see how that discussion went and see if it's something worth, worth uh, looking into as well. So we're seeing what we can do to help, help address that. That's all I have. Thank you. I was supposed to have been gone like an hour ago. Um, but I know now I understand we have a uh, executive session, so I'm still here. Um, I don't have much to say. I think tonight was probably, as long as it's been, it's probably one of our, our best nights of interaction. I think um, there, was no, there was no losers. I think everybody won. Um, and I think the most important thing is that we heard some different voices that we need to keep on um, the, 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 the front line. Um, Mayor will be doing um, the uh, housing conference again in April. And I think with the um, conversations that we've had tonight, um, I assume you'll still be the representative unless you want to appoint someone else. But I do think that, I know we cannot keep saying government is slow. We just can't do that. Whatever is making it slow, we need to figure it out and fix it. This um, short-term rental, it should not have been hanging out there for two years. Um, so whatever we need to fix, manager, uh, Williams to move stuff that now that doesn't mean a 50 item agenda either <laughs> so, but but um, whatever we can do to look what has still been there for a while let's bring it up so we so some of us won't get so caught off guard congratulations Tiffany you did it all of East Athens is going to thank you, and um, and um, I thank you. That's me. Um, okay, we're going to be quick. We got that other thing first. Uh, I I do want to say thank you to our, our uh, young people who came out speaking uh, about their concerns about Palestine. Um, you know, I, I hope you all received the letter, the email I sent you with the letter that I submitted to our federal representatives. Um, I, I really appreciate your respectful and thoughtful um, and thought-provoking comments as well. Um, Commissioner Hamby addressed Nick out there, who I know from my Dancing with the Stars days, or actually my tango for red with that. Anyway, um, I am now the chair of the LRC, so if you, if you email me, I can probably get someone else to find those. Um, those things. Broderick, I'm not sure if he's here, but he spoke, and I know that Tiffany and I have had some outreach from that committee on workforce development, and we're probably, very, both of us would be very um, uh, welcome the idea of sharing ideas more uh, with him, uh, or him sharing his ideas with us. A small thing for you all, but I want to thank my colleagues for putting the East Side Corridor Project on the consent agenda. That sounds like it's a small thing and it's really a small amount of money, but it's been very big for the East Side, for people coming together, for feeling a sense of tying this back into our earlier discussions, to feeling a part of a neighborhood and, and connecting with neighbors. Um, and then, you know, like Commissioner Thornton and uh, Fisher have referred to, I, th I think we had some really good discussions, work together. As someone said to me out in the hallway, there were different like coalitions tonight. It was sort of confusing. So, um, you know, anyway, I, I appreciate the way we're working together there. That's it. Um, yeah, I'm glad we came to, a, we could all come to an agreement on the short-term rental, um, that we're gonna get some, uh, tweak the ordinance some. Uh, but we got something passed where it's going to be tweaked, so I'm glad that we all could come together on that. Uh, I commend Tiffany for standing up for her district. Um, I'm 100% behind you, and good job with that. And um, that's it. Commissioner Hull, just uh, when you conclude, you could uh, make a motion yep. to uh, uh, enter executive following an executive yeah. session for the purpose of real estate discussion. Sure thing. 
Um, yeah, I'll try to keep this brief too. Uh, first, I just want a huge thanks to our solid waste staff who came through big on the most epic District 6 litter cleanup to date because it was uh, paired with a bulky waste cleanup. And uh, apparently we broke all the records on bulky waste collections, which was really wonderful. Um, and then they also, a few days later, joined me for a town hall where I think we had some really, really great discussions about all the many things they do. And the one big takeaway from that that I want to urge this body to consider, especially as we think about our strategic plan updates later this year, is the life of the landfill. Um, in my time on this commission, um, the life of the landfill has shortened by five or six years, even though I've only been on the commission for three. Uh, so the waste that this community is generating um, is exceeding our projections, and I, I do worry that with every really great cleanup like that, we shorten it only more, and, and so want us to think carefully about what else we can be doing, thinking about the next generation. Um, if, we, if it wasn't 11 p.m., I'd give you all the stats from the records being broken, but I'll leave those out. Um, uh, one small thing I want to note, uh, I'm glad to see that the bathroom signs upstairs were changed. Sometimes the little things can mean a lot. They meant something to me. Uh, I imagine it will to others. Um, and I'm glad that our agendas now consistently say public input in lieu of uh, citizen. I think that's also meaningful for folks. Although I do want to note there was one typo, I think, as these things get copy-pasted. The, the last round was called citizen instead of public. But um, I do want to thank those public commenters, and I, I do want to continue to urge the mayor and, and my colleagues to support placing a resolution on our agenda and subsequently passing it. Um, so I, I hope that we will do that at some point. Um, certainly, um, regardless of how people feel about if and when and how we should do that locally, um, you could join myself and 17 other elected officials in Georgia, including Representative Spencer Fry, by signing that letter one of the commenters mentioned um, that Jewish Voice for Peace has drafted um, that, that calls upon our federal officials um, to, to act. And I feel like that is one important gesture we can, we can take that's minimal effort and uh, takes no time in a meeting. Um, perhaps even if we all get on board with something like that, um, we'd have less time in meetings that we'd have to spend on this. Um, but since that is happening around the world, and therefore also our community is, I believe, a part of that, however small a part, um, to some degree I am grateful that we keep having this be a part of our meetings to remind us that while we have the privilege of discussing the finer points of legislation on the local level, there are people whose entire communities have been destroyed, and those communities have been destroyed with weapons that our country has provided with our tax dollars. Um, so I, I do hope that y'all will consider the meaningfulness of saying something, because that something, however small, might make a difference, just like those signs on the bathroom upstairs. Um, so with that, I will make a motion to enter executive session for the purposes of real estate acquisition and or disposal and to adjourn upon its conclusion. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you for being with us tonight. Everybody be safe out there.